The eye of all the world, the ancients called it. The heart of a lost empire that had lasted for a thousand years and more. Saint Sophia, the church of the divine wisdom. This was their crowning glory, the glory of Byzantium. vanished empire of Byzantium, born of pagan Rome. Byzantium, the dream of a Christian Roman Empire that stretched from Spain to Syria. Byzantium, whose influence ran from northern Russia down to Nubia upon the upper Nile. Byzantium, gateway to a lost chapter of our past. The Orient Express. I first travelled this line in the 60s. I bought a ticket at Waterloo Station in London for a ride to Istanbul in Turkey and a lifelong fascination. It took three days to get there. It was hell on wheels, really. Goats in the corridor and communism out the window. Then all of a sudden, the train swung round the bend and bang! The Orient hit me in the face. A great golden city by the sea set between the east and west. You could see it had been the center of the world. It was astonishing. I'd come to Istanbul. And underneath, the magic ruins of the lost empire of Byzantium. The Orient Express stopped here, in the heart of the old city. I got off it in clouds of smoke and steam, haunted by the ghosts of Greta Garbo and Agatha Christie, by a thousand spies and archaeologists, by the kings and courtesans of pre-war Europe. Istanbul, one of the very greatest of Islamic cities, with the monuments of the conquering Turkish sultans who had ruled here since 1453, dominating its skyline. Underneath, though, are much older ghosts, brushed each day by people of the living city, the ruins of Constantinople, the capital city of the Empire of Byzantium. Istanbul, Constantinople. Two names, new and old, for the same grand city. Sixteen centuries ago, in the year 330, the Emperor Constantine, the first Christian Roman Emperor, chose this city, then a small Greek town, to be his capital. No one quite knows why. One thing sure, though. The great warrior emperors had left Rome and the cities of the West forever. This mosque, 
the mosque of the Turkish Sultan who conquered the city, is built straight on the foundations of the most ancient burial church of the mysterious emperors of old Byzantium. What then was this most ancient, half-forgotten empire? The Empire of Byzantium. Byzantium. That magic, spicy word. Now, imagine that the empires of Greece and Rome had never died, but had been fused together in a single empire set between the East and West. And imagine that the emperors of this kingdom, the sacred emperors, could be torn to pieces by the mobs in the street. Emperors who could mutilate their courtiers and children, could kill their priests and blind whole armies of invaders. Yet emperors whose artists made some of the most finest, the most exquisite images the world has ever seen. Visions of heaven and earth, sublime architectures, copied by everybody from the caliphs of Baghdad to the popes of Rome, the kings of Germany and the tribes of Nubia. Visions of heaven's order and earthly power that still lie deep within the modern world. Just as this mosque, the Conqueror's Mosque, stands on the ruins of Byzantium, so do we all. This is where the empire of Byzantium began, beside this ancient column here on Main Street. A lonely ancient relic in a modern city. In the year of our Lord 330, on a lovely May morning, a great procession came down this road. It was the highway of an ancient city called Byzantium. And the procession was led by the great Roman Emperor Constantine. And he'd brought with him a bunch of priests, pagan and Christian ones, and they were all holding an incredible collection of relics. There were 12 baskets filled with crumbs, the residue, it was said, of our Lord's miracle of the loaves and fishes. There was the very axe that Noah made the ark with. And there was a statue that the Emperor himself had brought secretly from Rome, the statue of the Greek god Pallas. And at an exact moment prescribed by astrologers, they buried their relics just over there, at the foot of the column. Seven drums of porphyry brought from the Egyptian deserts. And Constantine renamed the city Constantinople and claimed it as the capital of his grand new empire. You know, over the years, the column itself came to be seen as a relic. And the Byzantines, that's the people who lived in this city, called it Christ's Nail, because they thought that the great golden statue of Constantine upon the top had something of one of the nails from Christ's crucifixion built into it. And every year on the New Year's Day, that's the 1st of September, the Byzantines turned up at the bottom of this column and sung hymns to Saint Constantine, the founder of their city and the mighty empire called Byzantium. Constantinople was designed to be the center of the Christian world, the center of Christ's government on earth. These great cups were made to hold the mystery of Christ's blood inside the city's churches, churches glowing with Roman gold and ancient holy images, images that for a thousand years flooded right through Europe and the East. This, then, is Byzantium's first story, the story of how, in two short centuries, a dream was made. The dream that was Byzantium. Constantine, the Christian emperor, the man who took the faith of Jesus and the God of Abraham 
and created the beginning of the governments and churches in which the West still trusts. He was crowned, they say, at York in England in 306. For 40 years, he had killed foes and family alike, and when he died, people were so frightened of him that no one touched his body for a week. This was the extent of Constantine's ambition. The late Roman Empire, with Constantinople, not Rome, as its capital. And in the far north, in Germany, the city of Trier, a great imperial garrison. It still shows something of what ancient Constantinople used to look like. The city gate, still guarding the main road into town. A great grim gate. Like the rest of the northern frontier, Trier was continuously threatened by Huns and Goths and Vandals and a dozen other warrior nations. Constantine the Great, the Emperor himself, would have walked down this same passage 1,600 years ago. These vaults and arches are the architecture of his time. Once you were through the gate, most Roman towns looked much the same. They were, if you like, a sort of an abstract idea of a city, and they were stamped on every landscape from Yorkshire to Syria. You can still sense their design in a thousand old world cities, and in the new world too. From Washington to San Francisco, planners still use parts of the same old patterns. All Roman towns had roads like this one. Wide thoroughfares that took you from the country to the heart of the city. This one is at Palmyra in the Syrian desert. For Constantinople, it was called, quite simply, the main road. Now, what you've got to see is that behind all these columns, there are little rows of shops running down the sides of the street. Butchers, bakers, candle makers, all sorts of people. In Constantinople, it would have had the goods of the known world. Africa, China, the Baltic, everything was for sale. Just imagine, the emperor, he's coming in in triumph, he's won a war and he's coming through the gate. The shopkeepers have been told to dust down the streets. Flowers have been strewn all over the pavement. Roses are raining down upon him. There are rugs and silks fluttering in the breezes all around him. The whole town has been sucked out to come and see him. Behind, of course, behind the main street, are all the town houses, servants, soldiers, all the people. There were taverns, brothels, everything in a city. And in amongst those, studded in amongst those, were those huge buildings that Constantine had to build before his city could really be called a Roman metropolis. It's only a little building, but it was actually the heart of ancient Palmyra. It's the Senate, the Oval Office, where government was conducted, where the town elders met, where plots were hatched, all that sort of thing. Of course, in Constantine's great imperial cities, this would have been a vast long hall. And quite often, in the central hall of government, great Constantine himself would have sat, where now the altars of Christian churches stand, because this is basically the same building. In the year 360, Constantine's son built a magnificent church at Constantinople especially for the drama of imperial communion. Next door, those same pious emperors built a giant racetrack, the Hippodrome. You can still see part of its outline in the streets. And here at last, around this old Egyptian obelisk, you can discover something of the atmosphere of ancient Constantinople. 
the heart of old Byzantium. This stone's like a giant mirror, reflecting all the life that once went on around it. There's the emperor and his family, Constantine's successors, come to the royal box to start a chariot race. There's the obelisk in the middle of the racetrack, and the chariots too, eight of them running all at once. You need a lot of luck to win. This place wasn't just a racetrack though. This is a place where people met the emperor and his court. It's the air, the space of Byzantium. A hundred thousand people roaring as new emperors are presented to them, as captives from foreign wars are brought and thrown at the feet of the emperor. It's the old parliament. It's the real heart of Byzantium. And that scene there, where have you seen it before? Look at it carefully. The emperor's in the middle with his family just like God. Around them stand the army and the court, just like the saints. Beneath them, begging mercy, the Byzantium's enemies, the damned. It's a grand last judgment right here on earth with the emperor playing God. So that's it really. The emperor brings happiness and harmony. The theater brings luck and victory. This is the center of the world, an image, you might say, of heaven on earth. So if we'd have pushed open the gates of the imperial palace that once stood beside the Hippodrome, we'd have really been opening the earthly gates of paradise. Arcades of gold and marble, silver boats on pools of mercury, silk carpets, golden thrones in halls of porphyry and pearls. All are gone. Only echoes of them still remain in Syria and Italy. Once, though, Constantinople held the palace of all palaces, the palace of the Christian Empire. Church, Hippodrome, and Palace. Constantine had made a sacred engine that would power Byzantium forever. To protect the holy city of Constantinople, the emperors of Byzantium built the largest city walls in all the world. Armies that controlled the lives of millions rode from these gates. And through them, passed the produce of an empire. The whole history of this city is in this gate. The great golden gate of Imperial Byzantium. You see that great high span at the top? That was once open to the skies. For 600 years, emperors and armies rode through that gate in triumph, coming back from wars against the Persians, the Arabs, the Bulgarians, the Russians. Then there was an earthquake. The gate was blocked. And that final gate at the bottom, that even a cavalryman couldn't come through on a horse, that gate was built in the final years of Byzantium. So this is a magic gate. It's a gate of legends. They say its wooden doors were covered with sheets of gold to give the gate its name. They say that the very last emperor killed fighting on these walls is buried beneath these stones, waiting for a call to take the city once again. So it's a gate of legend, but above all, it speaks of imperial Byzantine power. Power to control innumerable lives. You know, there are thousands of blocks in this gate, and each one of them, each tiny mark upon them, made by an individual human hand. Endless lives absorbed in making millions of these blocks. Enough to build the whole city of Constantinople. Now, this snowy marble, strange grey lines running through it, 
is found all over the Byzantine Empire, from Spain to Syria and back to Constantinople. But it comes from one island only, one tiny island in the sea. Southwest of Istanbul, three days sailing on an ancient slave ship, is the Isle of Marmara. Its very name means stone. In the first centuries of Byzantium, slaves in their tens of thousands worked in these marble hills. How the Byzantines love marble. In marble, says a priest, God trapped fields of flowers and mountain forests and fish and fruit and melting snows. The ancient blocks still strewn across the quays hint at the frantic energy that was once used to move their precious stone. Still inside the modern quarries, an ancient stone that weighs around a hundred tons, part of an enormous column to memorialize the military victories of Byzantium. If it were finished, it would have had a spiral staircase cut in it and rows of sculptured soldiers on its turning surface. It's still here, though. It cracked as it was quarried. In ancient times, these quarries were called the quarries of the Mother of God. They might just as well have been called the quarries of the Mother of Constantinople. The whole city was made here, and it was prefab city. It wasn't just sent off in blocks, everything was finished. If these had been finished and gone to Constantinople, each one had been lettered, it had its exact place in, in every one of the ancient buildings of the city. This, for example, is the very tip of a building that would have looked like a Roman temple. Modern quarry masters tell me that they find the best new scenes of marble in the hills, beside the ancient stones. This would be a good spot then. A giant lonely column shaft. I've seen that same shape, a so-called peacock's feather pattern, cut on a broken column lying right on the main street of old Istanbul. This was once a marble square on a highway at the middle of Constantinople. I don't suppose the Turks of modern Istanbul think much about ancient Byzantine victories. Yet there's still some fragments here of that great memorial column that made it all the way from Marmara. The ghosts of the imperial armies still lining the routes of their processions through the city. Just as all the ancient roads and sea lanes ran through the empire to Constantinople, so did the rivers of the region, channeled into great aqueducts, bringing treasured water to a thirsty city. Underneath the town, cut deep into its hilltop, an eerie underworld, some 15 centuries old, 
fresh water systems, so that the Byzantines could bathe just like the Romans did, in marble halls. And everything made with the dazzling technology of ancient Rome, the father of Byzantium. Marble columns, high brick vaults, the dark forests of Byzantium beneath modern Istanbul. Those Greek letters hammered into the column with a chisel point, the marks of one of Marmara's quarrymen. Food, too, flooded into the enlarging city. What a vast logistic exercise, an earthly miracle, supporting Constantinople's half a million people, Europe's biggest city, and everything, of course, by hand. There was no food industry. Everything was carried here in boats and carts. The finest fish, the Byzantines believed, were caught beside the Emperor's palace, between the rising of the Pleiades and the setting of the blood-red star Arcturus. Colors, smells and textures of the ancient everyday. The raw ingredients of Byzantine experience. The world of the ancient Mediterranean. Just like the people of modern Istanbul, the Byzantines loved fresh bread and fresh vegetables. Well, the bread, at least the grain for it, they brought from their province of Egypt. The vegetables they grew themselves. In little plots beside their houses in the city, in fields in a great green swathe that ran for mile upon mile down the walls of the city. And here's still a bit of it today, growing more or less the same crops. Look at the garlic, the onions, the dill. The dill they use to flavor fish, especially those heavy yellow fish soups they so love. And this, well, this is an ecological Byzantine delight here. There's three or four different sorts of crocs. There's rocket for salad. There's chard and cabbage again. All sorts of things, mint, all growing together in a great profusion. And at the end of it all, lettuce to calm your stomach. So when the peasants in the fields just stop there for a moment and straighten their backs to watch the lords of Byzantium, those great history makers riding by, they too could think, we're not having such a bad time either. The Byzantine economy was based on the classic Mediterranean diet. Wine, grain, cheese and vegetables and olives. Olive oil was a staple. It was Byzantium's fuel. It lit streets and homes and lighthouses. It oiled carts and cured baldness. And it was used for cooking. In its first centuries, Constantinople's oil came mostly from northern Syria. This is a wonderful thing. It's a piece of Byzantine industrial archaeology. It's a factory for making olive oil. This is a marvellous little place. I'll show you how it works. It's very sensible, very logical. The olives were picked from the trees. They came down that little street in wagons. They were tipped down through a window, and they fell into that trough down there. They were then scooped out of the trough and put into this mill. This is a great oil press for the berries. You see this drum? There were two of those. They fitted on end in here, side by side. A bar went between them, and four or five men pushed round the outside and reduced the olives, the skin, and the stone into a sort of horrible, messy pulp. That, then, was taken out of there and laid in these circles here. Now, this thing in the wall here held a great beam that ran through the air. 
and hanging above this was a huge cylinder of stone. And that then was slowly dropped onto the massive olive paste and the oil dripped down into these tanks. Not the end, because this, after all, although it's cold pressed, is actually a very impure oil at this moment. So they take it out of here and they put it into this tank here. Now this tank has already got water in it, so as they pour the olive oil in, it floats to the surface, all of the impurities go down to the bottom, and see this little trench here? A vital piece of gourmet equipment, because this is where the very finest oil ran from that impurity tank down into this tank to make fine, clear olive oil for the tables of Byzantium. This is Sigilla, one of 300 ancient Syrian villages with Byzantine olive groves. Provincial Byzantium, preserved in fine cut stone. Just off the main square is the public bathhouse, forerunner of the Turkish bath. St. John cast whores and devils out of one of these. This is Sigilla's cafe come town hall down on Main Street. Old soldiers and half-mad saints got drunk in bars like this. Money lenders, magistrates and merchants did their business here. Can you hear the farmers, tough, independent homesteaders, chuckling about the prices that the city folk were paying for their olive oil? Life was very good. There was time for both the devil and his baths, and for the church and all its works. If you'd have come up this path 1,500 years ago on the 1st of September, you'd have been accompanied by thousands of people shouting and singing praises to the Lord. It was the feast day of St. Simon of the Pillar. The first place these processions came to was this great baptistry. 10,000 people, whole cities full, had been baptised in this room in a single day. And then out they all went, praising the Lord, onwards to the Church of the Saint. It's Roman architecture still, of course. Arches, vaults and column tops. But now, there's Christian crosses too. The ancient forms are turning into something else. See? The wind of faith is bending all those ancient pagan patterns. This is the style that would become Byzantium. And at the church's hub, the remains of the 50-foot column on which St. Simon lived. So who was this weird man who lived up a pillar and half the world had come to see him? When he died, they built this beautiful dancing church in his honour. Well, as a young man, Simon had worn clothes so rough they'd made him bleed. And then he dreamt up the idea of chaining his left leg to a large rock. That before he went up the column. But Simon wasn't a nutter. Simon had tremendous presence like an emperor. He sat still and silent. And in these contests between flesh and the devil, it seemed to most people that he was beyond touch. And there he was on his pillar, halfway between heaven and earth, a perfect man to settle disputes. So they used Simon. The farmers of Syria would come here when they were in arguments and he would settle one against the other. The Bedouin, the Arab Bedouin came to see him too. The emperor used to come to see him. And always he acted as a balance in society. Such a terrifying balance that if he cursed somebody from the top of his pillar, a rock would explode next to the unfortunate individual. So Simon, it was a vital element in this new Christian empire. An element which somehow had taken the old stern order of the Roman age and left it 
halfway between heaven and earth. In the eastern Mediterranean, in the warm heartland of the pagan world, the first Christian empire, the empire of Byzantium, had found its balance. It was a good life, a rich life, and there was peace and plenty. You know, it always strikes me as funny when people talk about the fall of the Roman Empire. After all, standing here in Constantinople, it just got richer and richer and richer. Didn't fall at all. I suppose really it's because Rome fell. In fact, Rome didn't fall, it just got poor. Constantine had moved the capital from the great old cities of the west to here in the east. And with him moved the government, the generals, the artists and the architects. Everybody who made the empire moved with him. So in 475, that's 25 years after these walls were finished, the last Roman emperor of the west, a young man, a junior emperor, sent the crown back here to Constantinople, to new Rome. This was the new city. And I suppose really, the story about the fall of the Roman Empire, that's the Western Empire, was really invented in the Renaissance by the popes, who really wanted to get the idea of a pagan empire falling and the Christian Empire of the West rising. And they're good propagandists like Raphael and Michelangelo to budge them on their way. But the truth is, the real truth is, that old Rome, ancient Rome, had been modelled on the great cities of the East, on Antioch and Alexandria, all those great marble cities. So when you say Rome fell, it didn't fall at all. It simply went back home again. After the last emperor of the West resigned, Byzantium lost most of its European provinces. Only for a century, though. By the year 555, brand new Byzantine armies had ruthlessly reconquered some of them. And in northern Italy at Ravenna, they left triumphant decorations in this church as their memorial. The man there is Justinian, the emperor who 200 years after Constantine completely remade the Roman Empire. The man who made Byzantium. He was a man, they said, who was gentle and approachable a man who never showed his anger, a man who in the quietest of voices could order the death of thousands. He didn't organize the empire completely by himself though. His great strength was as a manager. Those strong faces that surround him were the faces of a great team of men he picked together. And he didn't really care whether they were Roman patricians or from the humblest, roughest backgrounds. He himself actually come from a completely illiterate peasant family in Serbia. Justinian, though, was only half the picture. The other half was that most remarkable woman over there, the Empress Theodora. They'd married each other for love, and they stayed together for 25 years. And look at the young ladies at the court there. They're looking sideways and a bit nervous. You see, it's not proper for young girls to look straight at you, not unless you're a woman of power like Theodora. But that is actually a portrait of a woman dying of cancer. Within two or three months of this mosaic being finished, Theodora was dead. Justinian ruled for another 20 years. He never remarried, and he went to her grave and lit candles until he was a very old man. Though Justinian and Theodora restored the Roman Empire. This was no longer the ancient classical world. They lived in a different age, spoke Eastern Greek instead of Roman Latin, and viewed the world in very different ways. Look at these sculptures. They're probably the last classical figures ever made. They were made, actually, in the generations just before Justinian. Now, at first glance, you might think they're just part of those usual old classical things you see hanging around museums. 
big stony Alexanders and Caesars all strutting their stuff. But they're not like that at all. They're new, they're different. Something else is going on. It's very simple work, very realistic in a way. Little light cut lines and a day old beard lightly chiseled on the hard marble as if to emphasize its transience, its insubstantiality. These people are pensive, sad and rather wise. After all, hadn't the saints and bishops told them that this life, this material world was only an illusion. So naturally, these statues don't strut their stony stuff like Alexander or the emperors of Rome. They are not heroic descriptions of skin and bone and straining muscle. Each man stands inside his own mysterious inner space that each one of us must occupy. And from that space, they look outwards from the soul towards the heavens. As you might expect, if you should move around them, the solid bulk of marble and humanity is seen to be nothing more than an illusion. These brand new people, though, were clever and inventive, too. Many of them were drawn here to the center of the empire. Most of Byzantium's brightest brains were packed into these tiny streets and apartments that surrounded the palace complex in Constantinople. There were people here come to seek their fortune at the court from all over the empire, from Spain, from Egypt, from Syria. There were mathematicians, lawyers, doctors, scientists, magicians, alchemists, all sorts of weird and wonderful people packed and living tightly together in these little streets. In the 520s and 530s, there was a great excitement bubbling up inside this unique community. Justinian and Theodora had planned to build new palaces and churches such as the world had never seen. The ancient forms, arches, vaults, and column tops, were being used for something revolutionary, something that will be echoed in 10,000 different churches for a 1,000 years and more. The style that is Byzantium. This seaside church, set right beside the palace, was made for some of Theodora's favorite priests. It was probably the work of one Anthemius, a famous physician and mathematician. This was where the style began. Theodora built the church to hold the blood-stained cloaks and bodies of two martyred soldiers, Sergius and Bacchus, the army's patron saints. Now it's a mosque. Anthemia's subtle compass has transformed all the usual ancient forms. Squares become circles, circles octagons, and all around a single central point. Space spins into ever smaller spaces. It's as perfectly mysterious as the finest natural crystal. The walls, the columns, seem to be nothing more than an illusion and simply fade away.
Just look at that great big glorious dome, like a huge melon, divided into 16 sections and held by eight wonderful swinging arches on those extraordinary V-shaped pillars and 28 columns through the church. It's like a vast net of stone and brick slung over this central space, this strange, mysterious space for the Imperial Communion. It's a wonderful piece of architecture, and it sold all sorts of problems that you can't even see. You see, those low domes exert tremendous pressure, and there's a force in this building to push the bottom of it out so the whole thing comes crashing down. Now, Anthemius, like every other architect, has used stone here as lintels and beams, as stress and strains, the old way of doing things. But he's come up with a brilliant idea to hold the church together. And it's this cornice, this huge, beautiful marble cornice with its inscription to Justinian and Theodora. This isn't just here for decoration. This links the church in a chain. It binds the stones together. A great necklace for the church, brought from a shining island in a bright blue sea. Throughout Justinian's long reign, the Marmara quarries were hard at work, shipping stone for a new crop of imperial churches. This was building on a grand scale, churches for every country in the empire. But the biggest of them all was a new church for the Imperial Communion at Constantinople. For this, the quarry masters were cutting larger and yet larger versions of Anthemius's clever interlocking cornice. Here's a piece of one of those stone chains under construction. And here's its secret. Each block was held to the next block by a great iron bracket held in lead that ran between the two stones. And Theonis's engineers use rather a lot of iron in their buildings. It's part of a whole new series of techniques that allow them to think more daringly, more bravely than any other architects have done before. Above all, it enabled Justinian himself to have the ambition to conceive of the greatest dome the world has ever seen. Such mysterious cargoes, such magic marbles from across the empire, now sailed the seas and came to the holy city of Byzantium to be gathered up upon the site of the Imperial Communion. This is the finished dream, the tense climax of all of ancient engineering, a lively frame built with prayer and pragmatism to hold the largest dome the world had ever seen. This, though, is just the outside of a sacred theatre. Inside, a forest of columns rises up in ecstasy. The walls, glass and gold and marble, light and dark, insubstantial and illusory, seem to simply fade away. A perfect sea of space for God's holy wisdom to come down and touch the earth. A perfect theatre for the anthems of Byzantium. Lo, the lords of heaven and earth have come. Blood-red columns of Egyptian porphyry were taken, so it was said, from the Temple of the Sun at Rome. The church's wooden doors from Noah's Ark. The building's bronze was stripped from the Temple of the Goddess Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the pagan world. No wonder that the building has itself become a legend. Poets said 
The church combined the size of sunset and the scale of quarries. The hues of birds and fish and precious stones. All the textures and experience of that ancient everyday. The living pink of baby's fingernails. The rising of the bright red star Arcturus. In Byzantine, in Greek, this church was called the Church of Hagia Sophia, the Church of Holy Wisdom. All of Justinian's enormous empire, its wealth, its piety, its pagan heritage, was gathered up inside it. Throughout the next nine centuries, this vast old building stood right at the center of Byzantium a symbol of its true destiny on Earth. And on the last day of Byzantium, the Emperor and his troops came here to pray before they walked out onto the city walls to die. For these were the vaults that held the dream, the dream that was Byzantium. Pictures of Mary, Jesus and the saints. Images from the long lost empire of Byzantium. This is a journey of discovery, a search for the origins of Western faith, a tale of ancient battles that changed the world forever. pagan Roman Empire, Byzantium still stands at the heart of the modern world. Its ideas of heroes and of villains, of government both good and bad, and the right of law. All the cities of Byzantium held holy images within them. Sacred pictures, it was said, that came from heaven. They were carried into battle. People died to save them from destruction. This is their story. This is the heart of the ancient palace of the Popes of Rome. It's centuries older than the Vatican and filled with holy wonders. Believers say that Jesus Christ once walked upon these steps, that they were taken from Pontius Pilate's palace in Jerusalem. The steps were brought to Rome in the first centuries of Christianity and are reverenced still by millions of people every year who pass up them on their knees deep in penitential prayer. Inside the ancient chapel at their top, Rome's most holy picture, an image made, so it was said, not by human hands at all, a 
portrait so powerful that when, deep in the Dark Ages, the barbarians stood at the gates of ancient Rome, the awe-inspiring image crippled the tribesmen with its paralyzing gaze and sent them running back to Germany. Paintings entirely encased in silver. The nearest you can get to it is that little face on the top, which is actually painted on linen and lays right on the ancient panel. And that type of face, a round one with dark hair, is probably the nearest you can get to an authentic portrait of Jesus. The original was said to have been painted on the walls of Pontius Pilate's palace by the first Christians. The real painting underneath it's been entirely washed away a thousand years ago. That doesn't matter, really. This is more than a picture. It is literally a window into heaven, a link between divinity and the earth. The Romans call their painting the Acheropita, an ancient Eastern word that means a picture made in heaven. It was actually made in the seventh century in the Empire of Byzantium, part of a standard set of pictures of the people of the Bible. All those images come from the East. They're our most basic images of kings and gods and governments, of heroes and mothers and villains, all those types we take for granted. And their story of how they got from the East to the modern West is an astonishing tale. They've come through fire. It's a story of blindings and hatreds and the light of faith. It's our story, and it's a part of the story of Byzantium, too. The story starts in the year 360 just a few years after the Roman Empire had accepted Christianity, when a pagan pilgrim came here to the Greek sanctuary of Delphi to ask the god Apollo if the ancient pagan images would ever again be honored and worshiped in the ancient ways. Deep down under Apollo's vast temple, an old lady sat, filled with the fumes from a volcanic crack underneath and drugged with cyanide. She babbled a reply, and a priest took down her words in classic verse. Tell the world the glorious temple has fallen. Apollo's springs are dry. The world no longer has a prophet. Using the signs and symbols of the ancient gods, Apollo's priest had just announced the ending of the pagan world. In the pagan world, the gods controlled everything. From the movements of the stars in the sky to the fishes in the sea. And their signs and symbols were everywhere. They protected crops and trees. They were in every stone. When the thunder came down, you understood it because it belonged to a god and every god had its sign. It was a complete universe and everybody felt secure in it. When Christianity took over the Roman Empire, it attacked and swept away all these signs. Now, these signs were as old as man himself. And Christianity was pretty poorly supplied with alternatives. After all, it was a language of books and words. But unless it was to fail, it had to develop and develop quickly a whole new set of images for the world. The trick, the genius, you might say, wasn't just to swap this ancient chaos of 10,000 pagan signs and symbols for a single set of Christian images but to find a quick way of spreading these Christian images and pictures right through the ancient Mediterranean. Books. Books were the answer. Books were invented at the same time that Christianity started. 
Before that, there were scrolls. Now there were pages. This is a copy of one of the oldest books in the world from the first centuries of Christianity. Look, if you flip through it, you see pictures. They're illustrating the narrative. If that would have been a Christian book, it could have gone from one end of the Mediterranean to the other and taken a whole set of Christian pictures, a story for the walls of a church. Well, that's just a copy. These images, these ancient images, are so precious that real books of that age, from the fifth century, some of the oldest pictures in the world that have come from books are now not in books but trapped in glass. Look, here is Jupiter. This is a pagan book illustrating pagan poetry and it's a picture of Jupiter, the king of the gods, and he's got a halo, just like Christian saints will have in their pictures. And he's holding a globe, just like Christ will, in a thousand churches. And he's sitting under the ark of heaven, as Christ does. And he's king of the stars and the moon and the sun. This is, this is a pose which says to you, king. You can't have Jesus king of the world unless he looks like a king. That looks like a king. That's where they're getting, as it were, their iconography from, straight from the pagan faith. Now look at this. Here's another one of these very precious ancient illustrations, really the roots of our Western art. Think of that. When you make gestures today, when you go, victory, or communism, fascism, bang, bang, you're doing universal gestures. They get emotions in you immediately. This said to the early Christians similar sorts of things. Look, here is a Roman general and his mistress and a friend having dinner. They're sitting around a table, they've got halos on. Everybody would know this was an imperial table. There's a, there's a way of drawing tables, even with a fish on a plate in the middle. You'll see that in churches. You'll see that same image, except there, it becomes the Last Supper. The first imperial images to tell the stories of the Christian Bible, to symbolize its faith, came from this city, a thousand miles to the east of Rome, ancient Constantinople, now Istanbul in modern Turkey. The Emperor Constantine the Great dedicated this column when he founded Constantinople in the year 330. From that year on, the city stood at the heart of Constantine's vast empire, the first Christian state, master of the greatest cities the world had ever seen, Alexandria, Antioch and Rome, and the capital of the brand new empire of Byzantium. From the very beginning, Constantinople really sizzled New religion, new state, new government, everything here was up for grabs. Amazingly enough, we have a good idea of how it felt to be alive inside this city and at just this time in history. It's a 1,500-year-old press photo. It's not on film, though. It's on ivory. There's the pole for the poor old elephant's tusk. The Byzantines imported ivory from India and from Africa. This probably came from Africa because it's so enormous. It would have come, of course, through Egypt, up through the empire to Constantinople. The Byzantines loved ivory. They thought it had a texture like living skin. This, then, is the only glimpse we have of life in Constantinople in about the year 420. It's a procession. Two priests are carrying the bones of St. Stephen of Jerusalem on a royal carriage into the imperial palace of Byzantium. The mighty emperor Theodosius II is walking with his ministers and soldiers right through the center of the city. Theodosius procession would have passed up this very street. This is modern Istanbul. In those days, in the fifth century, it was called Constantinople. We're walking between the docks and the ancient center of the city. I suspect it was much the same in those days, but there would have been thousands of people 
watching the emperor on his way to the palace. Do you know, these processions, especially at that time, were a very tense affair. These sort of cities, these great classical cities, were a thousand years old. But the Christian bishops that ran them were starting to look at them with brand new eyes. The times really were a changing. They saw the rich on the way to church to tend to their souls, kicking beggars out the way by the doors of the church, children mutilated by their parents to make them look more pitiful. And they saw the rich women walking, they said, with a thousand meals swinging from their ears. And they didn't like what they saw. The Christian bishops wanted a moral city, a sexless city, a pure city, and a more equitable city too. So that, perhaps, is why the emperor isn't sitting in his carriage, but walking in the street and carrying a candle with his courtiers. From the bones of a poor man from Palestine, riding in the royal coach. The emperor's procession was on its way to a grand square, halfway between the palace and the court church. I think our ivory procession would have passed through here, right through the heart of the ancient city. Now, you see that Turkish bath over there? That's in about the same place as the gate on our ivory. And see the great high dome on the gate? And see that figure of Christ, that face of Christ on the gate? That was such a famous figure. It was called Christ of the Gateway, the most famous and influential portrait of Christ. It was copied from the great shining ivory statue of Zeus of the Seven Wonders. That was parked in a palace just over there. Now, think of our procession moving along. You see, they're going past this great portico, three high stories of it, people peering out arches, looking down, swinging their incense, pleased to see the saint arriving in the city to make the new Jerusalem, joining heaven to earth. And over there, look, that's about a spot where the church, the brand new church of St. Stephen is being built. It's ready to receive the relics, but they haven't finished the roof and the tilers are still working away up there. But the Empress is proudly waiting by the door, holding a cross. And that is quite extraordinary. For the first time in the ancient world, the centre of attention is not the emperor, but an empress. She carries the cross of victory. She receives the holy relics into her church. It's probably the virgin empress, Pulcheria. In that most ancient language, signs and symbols, the little ivory is telling us about an ancient revolution, and one that still affects the world today. In the first years, many of Christianity's most famous pictures were made here, in the grounds of the great monastery of St. John Studios at Constantinople. These monasteries were Pulcheria's holy battlegrounds, the places where she conjured up the sacred images and metaphors with which she waged her earthly arguments. At the center of this ancient image factory, one of Constantinople's oldest churches, where the sacred signs and stories were put to powerful use. Imagine that it is Easter, April the 15th, 428, and that this nice new church is filled with all the nobles of Constantinople, men downstairs, women upstairs in the galleries. Suddenly, there is a great hush. The Imperial Guard and the Emperor and all his family have walked into the church. Now, in the middle of these churches, there's a stone pulpit. For more than a century now, preachers have been giving fire and brimstone from these pulpits, using all the language, all the signs and symbols of the Christian faith and the ethics of the Bible. They laid out 
the whole structure of this brand new Christian empire. And the emperor and his family listened in humility. Right on this line here, there was an altar rail. It separated the main body of the church from the high altar. Only the emperor and his priests were allowed in here, close to the divine mystery of communion. In 428, though, things were rather different. Theodosius, the emperor, was usually accompanied to the altar by his sister, Bulcaria. They'd ruled together since they'd been children, two frightened toddlers in a palace filled with intrigues and plots for the succession. When she was 14, Pulcheria had hit upon the answer. She dedicated an altar to her own virginity and to the rule of the emperor. From that moment on, they ruled a strange, sacred couple like Joseph and Mary, and there were no plots for the succession. It had also given Pulcheria a unique role within the church. On that particular Easter day, though, things turned out rather differently. Bulcaria's way to the altar was barred by the new patriarch of Constantinople, one Nestorius. He said that only men could enter the sanctuary. Bulcaria was aghast. Her new role as a virgin had projected women in a different way. She was as pure as gold, she said. She had kept herself as soft as fleece to receive the Holy Spirit. Have I not given birth to God, she cried? Nestorius, though, was a man of the old school. He preferred to see women as the daughters of Eve, that unfortunate lady who dabbled in snakes and sex and sin. You, he said to Pulcheria, have given birth to Satan. And there you have it, really. The three roles of women laid out in the early Christian church. Sinners, virgins, and mothers. By opening the debate, Pulcheria not only advanced the role of the Virgin Mary and women in Byzantium, define the role of women in Christendom forever. Encouraged by Pulcheria, the next full council of the church declared Mary the mother of Jesus to be Mary the mother of God. It was a defining moment. Nestorius' challenge to the Empress Pulcheria was now seen as an insult to the Virgin Mary. He was declared a heretic and exiled. Thanks to Pulcheria, the family of the Emperor of Byzantium had become a mirror image of the Holy Family in the Court of Heaven. That is why these medieval emperors offer their city and an image of this church, St. Sophia, Byzantium's cathedral, for the protection of the Virgin Mary. Christ's mother is their mother too. After Pulcheria, the emperors of Byzantium ruled by divine right and by right of birth, and all later Western kings imitated them. Pulcheria had cast that spell of power and sanctity that still surrounds the offices of government today. She'd also changed the way that men saw women and women saw themselves. Once more, ancient images tell the story. Pagan Greeks and Romans loved public displays of sexuality inside the city. They seemed to hold the force of life within them. They gave assurances of immortality. The Christians, though, had gazed upon eternity. Just as they destroyed the pagan temples, so they attacked the pagan body image. Byzantine preachers said that the silent power of nakedness threatened anarchy within the family and the state, and it was covered up. Women like Bulcaria, who once had flaunted wealth and beauty at the public baths, 
now lived regretful, celibate, in hermits' huts inside their marble palaces. No longer was each man an Alexander and every woman Venus. Right through the empire, the cities of Byzantium were filling up with Christian piety. Yet it was still a magic, superstitious world. A world, too, where those who knew the will of God held quite enormous power. Hermits like Saint Simon of the Pillar, who preached in Syria, and did not hesitate to question the behavior of the emperor himself. Since you have become arrogant, O Emperor, and since your heart has forgotten the Lord, your God, who gave you the imperial crown and the imperial throne, and since you have become a friend of the feckless, faithless Jew, then know this. Soon you will face divine judgment, and then you will raise your hands to heaven and moan. Impiety, then brought down the wrath of God. Piety, on the other hand, brought prosperity, good government, and victory too. The preachers kept their eyes on the great cities and on the countryside as well. For the people who fed and fueled Byzantium were also at the mercy of the Lord. Deep in Turkish Anatolia, this little village was once the city of St. Michael of 10,000 angels, famed for its fine churches. In Byzantium's countryside, life was on a knife edge between prosperity and starvation, between flesh and the devil. Magic stones still eased the pain of reaping and of childbirth. Magic images, half cockerel, half snake, all dressed in armor, still kept the evil eye at bay. Byzantium was built on the memories of this pagan past, sometimes even from the same old stones. Ancient demons haunted the countryside, stopped up wells, curdled milk, and threatened plague and madness. Many saints were really doctors, ministering to a madness born of holy terror. Their prayers drove out the ancient devils, safeguarded animals and crops. For archaeologists, of course, such goings on are very hard to excavate, yet sometimes there are clues to them. Still lying on the swelling earth, If you ever wondered what attracts archaeologists to one place rather than another, this hill is a wonderful example. Just look at its shape. It's a bit strange in the landscape. Look at all this white stone. This is building stone. Well, that's interesting, you might think. But then I found this. See? It's a very rare piece of marble, just like the Byzantines used to use to clad the walls of buildings. So it's quite a rich building. Here's a bit of the roof. So we got the walls and the ceiling, everything you could need. What the devil is it? Well, look a bit closer. And here you can find something absolutely unique. This field is studded with tiny little bits of glass. These bits of glass are very special. These are mosaics, and they were made from the 5th to the 7th or 8th centuries. That makes this field unique. Look around and you'll soon discover why such a sophisticated city church was built here deep in the countryside. Long before the Christians took over its magic, this area had been a pagan sanctuary, a place of sacred springs and running waters, a little paradise. Well, this is the place that's given this region its name, Old Turkish Yurme, 
Greek Germia, Roman Thermae. That's a hot spring over there. Once it was a great pagan shrine. That Christian church then, that Christian church on the hill with those mosaics, perhaps that's its exact descendant. It's a magic place. Once there were many places like this in Anatolia. Once upon a time, in the early years of Christianity, a pagan washerwoman called Hypatia said that she would become a Christian only if she could see the face of Jesus for herself. And straight away, the story goes, she found a portrait of the Lord floating on the waters of the village spring. And she was very frightened and clutched the picture to her breast. And then Hypatia found she had two pictures, the original panel and another imprinted on her dress. It was a miracle. Such powerful images, fallen straight from heaven and mysteriously duplicating, are called Acheropita. Tradition has it that several of them still survive, the Acheropita in the ancient palace of the popes at Rome, the great shroud of Turin, In the 6th century, Hypatia's panel painting became Byzantium's battle icon, a picture to paralyze the enemy with a terrifying gaze. With such miraculous signs and symbols, how could the Byzantines ever lose? Yet lose they did, and with that loss, Byzantium and all its signs and symbols were forever changed. These are the ruins of a Byzantine border fortress, set right up on the edge of the Syrian desert. In the seventh century, the east exploded. The Byzantines moved on Persia, and the Persian armies moved towards Byzantium. Vast battles rolled back and forth across these plains for a quarter of a century and more. These magisterial armies with their gold and silver and their standards and their generals and all the panoply of ancient war. And at the end of it, all of Persia was destroyed and all of Byzantium had been sacked except one city, that of Constantinople. And at the same time as this tremendous battle was going on, small tribes were infiltrating up through the empire. One of them brought bubonic plague. It was so bad in Constantinople that 10,000 people a day died from it. The bodies were piled in a fortress and a terrible smell of death hung over the city. One of these tribes from a Byzantine trading city in Arabia found a great prophet in their midst, Muhammad. Muhammad had the ability to turn a personal religious revelation into an immediate political reality. Fired by his genius, the armies of Islam swept through the devastated landscapes of the East. In 636, in a gigantic battle on the Golan Heights in Syria, the Byzantines were crushed. Not long after, the best part of the Byzantine Empire, that vast empire that once had run from Spain to Syria, was ruled by Arab courts. At the same time, the nation of the Slavs had broken through the northern Byzantine defences on the Danube and were raiding south, down into Greece and even threatening Constantinople. Old Byzantium was completely broken an ancient way of life was coming to an end. The story of the Syrian city of Apamea could serve for a hundred others. Apamea had been a huge rich city for a thousand years. In pagan times, it had had a sprinkling of philosophers and fine temples. Antony and Cleopatra came here on their honeymoon. 
Byzantine Apamea too had its share of elegance, of churches, relics and fire-eating bishops. There'd been hundreds of cities like Apamea throughout the empire of Byzantium. But now, after the great wars, they'd all collapsed. It's very difficult to see a disaster in archaeology. Things stop, all you get is ash. In the Byzantine Empire, coinage practically stopped being issued. This meant that nobody could collect taxes, nobody could mend anything anymore. There were no inscriptions. History practically stopped. After the 7th century, the survivors came back into the ruins and started to build little houses and small fortresses amongst the great spines of the broken cities. At that point in the world, Constantinople was the only imperial city left unconquered. You could say that Byzantium had changed from an empire of cities to an empire of fortresses. Much of 7th century Constantinople must have looked like this. Old Monomvasir in southern Greece. The city's walls protected refugees from the lost empire. Soldiers, craftsmen, landowners. Its churches were filled with images from 10,000 distant shrines. Its open squares and public highways were choking up with curving lanes and little alleyways. The scale of life had changed completely. People now stayed by the family fireside, read books in silence by themselves, cultivated their songs, engaged in clandestine love affairs. Even patterns of eating and drinking changed. Take bread, for example. Corn in Constantinople largely came from Egypt. After the Arab invasions, there was no corn from Egypt. No free bread handouts, first time in hundreds of years. Worse than that, the wheat that came from the north actually tasted different, but it rose, it rose like modern bread. And that's really where the modern loaf starts, I think. But it wasn't just the food you eat, it was actually the way you ate it. Ancient people had sat on couches and been served by slaves. They didn't really have knives and forks, there was nowhere to put them. Now, with chairs and tables, people were sitting down so that the great classical spoons were filed down to make a little fork which you could prod the food. Pretty soon people would be cutting their own food up with knives. Other changes too. With the loss of Syria to the Arabs, practically all the olive oil trade dried up. So you had to light your house with candles. They were quite expensive. Not so many fry-ups either. There were more boiled foods now from the north. Northern foods called more for, for beef than pork. The northerners too brought different clothes with them. Byzantium was cold. People took up wearing trousers for the first time. And those tough guys from the north with their long hair began to be copied by the Byzantines. If you want to look cool and groovy and wild, you look like a northerner. The old classical world was disappearing. Behind the high stone walls, there was uncertainty and stress and fear. And in the age-old way, Byzantium expressed this change of mood with the signs and symbols of its faith. This is a very good example of what I mean. In its day, this coin was absolutely unique. Instead of having a picture of the emperor on the front, it had a picture of the Christ that was over the palace gate. It's extraordinary. Nobody knows why it was done. One sure thing it did, it cut the Arabs off from using it because they didn't agree with religious portraits. So the Byzantine exchequer was sort of shut off from them from this moment because the coins had a picture of Christ on. There's another side to this too. There were lots of Byzantines at the same time who didn't like pictures of Christ. There was a debate broke out inside Byzantium, whether it was a good idea or not a good idea to have images. It was a debate that went on with blindings, burnings, maimings and ferocity for over a hundred years, and it changed Byzantium forever. By the 8th century, after the invasion of Byzantium, 
Constantinople, the ancient capital, stood at the center of a gathering storm. The storm called iconoclasm, which means quite literally, the destruction of the images. In the year 730, there was a whole lot of agitated people milling around in this square. They'd come here because they'd heard that the emperor wanted to take down the great picture of Christ that hung above the palace gateway. They loved the picture. They didn't want it taken down. It healed the sick. Now, this painting stood under the great high arches of the palace gate somewhere over there. And a soldier put up a ladder to go and get the painting, and somebody rushed out of the crowd and pushed the ladder down and killed the soldier. But the other soldiers took the painting down and arrested the person who'd killed their friend. And they had her executed. And Saint Theodosia, the virgin martyr, became the first victim of iconoclasm. Iconoclasm, the cataclysm of the paintings. This movement that started in the palace of Byzantium to destroy all holy images. 30 years after they took the picture down from the palace, the iconoclasts, that is the people who were destroying the images, went through the great church itself. The patriarch was murdered, all the images were taken down. And though the angels came down from heaven, so it was said, and beat the impious emperors, the iconoclasm continued. Glass mosaics were pounded into dust. Books were ripped apart. Wooden panel paintings chopped into pieces. And the blood of the holy images, so it was said, soaked the clothing of the iconoclasts. It wasn't only little things either. The monuments of the city were actually covered in images. This, for example, was part of a great milestone that stood at the center of the city. The emperor decreed that the sacred image of the Virgin that it contained should be scraped away and a picture of his favorite charioteer put up in its place. What on earth was going on? Once more, signs and symbols tell the story. About the year 750, that same emperor who so hated holy images restored this fine old church, St. Irene's in Constantinople. The plain cross is the measure of the man, the pious emperor Constantine V, a single-minded soldier. Like other emperors and generals of the time, Constantine V believed the sacred pictures were evil in the sight of God. The church contains no other images. We move in a dangerous and mysterious age. Part of the dark mystery of iconoclasm was actually solved a few years ago in the Vatican Library by the study of this old book. Now this book, well, it was clearly more than a thousand years old, but the text in it was twice as old as that and more. This is called Ptolemy's Handy Tables, and it was written in ancient Alexandria and Egypt, and it describes all the passages of the stars and the sun and the moons through the sky. What was so remarkable about this copy of it was not simply its beauty, but also the fact that it had been written at the height of iconoclasm, right at that burning beginning when every image in the churches were being destroyed. Now, the key of this book and the central image of it is this beautiful plate in the front. And it shows you, it's a sort of a diagram from the most ancient world of astrology. There's the zodiac signs around the edge, all those wonderful old signs all added together to make a sort of cosmos. And in the middle, this iconoclast artist has actually painted Apollo, the sun god. This is the ancient Greek world. It revolves around the sun. And there's Apollo in his chariot sailing through the sky. Isn't that extraordinary? These pious emperors who think so deeply and so hard about Christianity have put Apollo in his chariot at the center of the universe. Why didn't they have done that? The truth is, of course, this man is interested in these old pagan values. He's thinking of luck. 
charioteers, his favourite charioteers, ran races and won them in the centre of Constantinople. The charioteers brought luck and victory to his city, and that's what these iconoclasts wanted. They wanted a pure Christianity, but they wanted that most ancient virtue, luck. In the great spasm of iconoclasm that passed through Byzantium in the 700s, the monasteries and nunneries along this lonely coastline to the south of Constantinople sheltered both the artists and the holy images. The battle for the icons ebbed and flowed throughout Byzantium like a summer storm. But you know, those pictures never really left the people. They were too much beloved. The monks really fought for them. The monks of the great imperial monasteries of Constantinople, the monks that lived here in this idyllic land along the coast of Marmara, they died for those pictures. There were icons too, even in the royal palace. The ordinary people liked them. The people in the royal family liked them. Constantine's the fifth own son was married to a girl from Athens called Irene who kept icons in the palace. Now Irene was an interesting lady. She wanted the icons back. And when her son finally became emperor in his own right, she took him back to the room where he'd been born, a room of shining porphyry, and had him blinded and restored the pictures. That terrible story of Irene wasn't the end of the iconoclasm. Fifty years later, they were still torturing people who liked pictures. A painter called Lazarus had his hands forced down on sheets of red-hot iron to stop him painting, and still he got a paintbrush in his crippled hand and painted a new image of the Halke Christ on the gate of the Imperial Palace. And that, as the people of the city knew, was the restoration of the pictures. In the year 867, on the 29th of March, the Patriarch of Constantinople, one Photius, dedicated the first pictorial mosaic in the Church of St. Sophia, the great cathedral of Byzantium. Beside it, in mosaic, was a single sentence these images that the heretics cast down have been set up again by pious emperors. The iconoclasts had lost the century-old debate. Even in her image, Photius tells us, the Virgin graces and delights. She strengthens and she comforts us. Once again, the holy pictures filled Byzantium with their unearthly presence. In Saint Sophia, images of Christ were placed up in the dome and here, above the church's central door, where only the emperor could enter. Not the favorite Western image of a mortal Christ impaled in time upon a cross, but the old familiar figure from the palace gate, Christ of all time and of all places, Christ, Lord of the cosmos. Before this ancient image, penitent emperors now prostrate themselves in awe. Not long ago, there was a better ending to this story, here in the ancient walled city of Nicaea, close to Constantinople. In the first years of Byzantium, the Christian creed had been written in this pretty little city, and approved here too, by the first council of the church. Over the following centuries, Nicaea had filled with little churches. One of them, a miniature Saint Sophia, 
decorated with mosaics that celebrated the return of icons after the iconoclasm. Now, though, you can only see the glittering scenes in old photographs. The triumphant angels, the exquisite Madonna drawn over the shadow of the iconoclast's plain cross. All of this was blown away in the Greek and Turkish wars of 1922. And each side still blames the other. How is it that people can show such tremendous ferocity to such quiet beauty? such passive images? Well, I think it depends upon the way you look at pictures. You see, that virgin that stood here in the nave of this church, like the one in St. Sophia, wasn't like a Western picture. It wasn't just a picture of a woman in a blue dress sitting on the chair with a sacred baby. It wasn't like a record of an event. These pictures were actually intended to actually take part of the identity of the Virgin, part of the eternal cosmic identity of the Virgin. Something was there at the beginning of time and there at the end of time, and you had it in your church as every little icon, every little picture throughout the empire refracted these bits of holiness throughout the empire. The emperors didn't want that. They wanted to gather all that dispersed holiness around their own person in the city, along with the sacred relics inside their palace, just as they collected the taxes. So they wanted that power to themselves. But the Byzantines came from one of the most ancient cultures of the Middle East. The people wanted their images. So the triumph of the pictures, you might say, is really a compromise. The emperor gets his sacredness, his divine power, and his taxes in Byzantium. And the people get their pictures. The compromise is the most indelible aspect of the Byzantine identity. This is a picture of a procession carrying an icon. And it was made six centuries ago in the last years of Byzantium. It gives a precious glimpse of Constantinople's most famous image of the Virgin Mary, painted, it was believed, from the life by St. Luke himself. Underneath are some of those who centuries before had fought iconoclasm and found their way to paradise. St. Theodosia, the Virgin Martyr, the abbots of the monasteries, the artists, they hold the pictures that they died for. Pictures painted with such passion and precision, such blazing colour, such quiet power. They say that on the last night of Byzantium, on the evening of Monday, the 28th of May, in 1453, just hours before Constantinople fell to the armies of the Turks, that the Virgin came down into her city for the last time and took her picture back to heaven. The Empire of Byzantium 
that golden dream. The climax of ancient Rome and Greece. One emperor, one single faith. A dream that lasted for a thousand years. A dream shattered by the armies of the West. Byzantium traveled from Iceland to China, from Ethiopia to Russia, to every kingdom on the earth. And at its center, Constantinople, the world's great marketplace. Its fabled wealth, its gold, its emeralds, its palaces, its glittering churches. A legend so rich it caused its own destruction. Founded in the year 330, the Christian Empire of Byzantium had its center here, in Istanbul, in modern Turkey. The Byzantines called this city Constantinople. A thousand years ago, it was the richest city of them all, the eye of all the world. In the very center, the ancient church of Saint Sophia, converted now into a mosque. Here, the emperors of Byzantium met the king of heaven, the lords of this world and the next, the center of the Christian universe. Visions of this holy city and its golden emperors filled the mind and the imagination of every medieval prince and king until one day, an army of the Christian West came here and destroyed it. Beside the church, above the sea, a shadowed park with five centuries of buildings in it, the Palace of Byzantium. A thousand years ago, there were gold pavilions here, chapels, mansions, set in a sea of green. An earthly paradise one of the most potent ancient legends of our planet, the home of God's emperor on earth. So where is the holy palace of Byzantium in modern Istanbul? That's a lump of it there, a sad, pathetic pile of brick. You have to go into the streets, into the alleyways. You really need a map. Look, I'll show you, modern Istanbul, why the maps always open the wrong way? Modern Istanbul, ancient Constantinople. I'll show you what I mean, look. There's the great Roman roads coming into the centre of town. The Hippodrome, where the people met the emperor. The great church just beside it. And there, between that wall and that one there, that whole area was all palace. Dozens of buildings, dozens of churches, all together high and glittering right across the hill. So you might ask, where the hell is it now? The Golden Palace is buried beneath old Istanbul. The little streets are haunted by its lost pavilions, by ghosts of ancient gardens, by the shadows of its courtiers and generals. The enormous curve of the imperial racetrack still stands there, a shattered wonder of the medieval world.
We're right at the very heart of the palace of Imperial Byzantium. And there's a corner shop. Well, at least you can say the Byzantines invented corner shops. They had a law about them. There should be one in every street, they said, for the necessities of life. Back there, though, that's something else. That's a part of the palace itself. Just part of the foundations, though. Once they held a great high terrace, not that tea house up there, where the emperors walked each evening in the fading light, their fine silks flowing gently in the fresh sea breezes. Constantinople was the greatest seaport in the medieval world. Arab, Russian, Viking and Italian boats once sailed along these walls. This is the ruin of an imperial pavilion some 14 centuries old. The warm sea once splashed against these walls. Those are the doors through which the emperor once walked to board the royal yacht, the Greyhound. The emperors like to live beside the seaside, so it's always a good idea to, when you're walking along the seaside walls of Constantinople, to look and see if these little gates give you something of the entrance to the palace. Some of them don't look much today, but they're very interesting. See this Greek text? It's part of a Greek version of the Book of Habakkuk, a text we know once was laid around the base of a great statue of the Emperor Justinian that stood in the centre of the city. So this, then, is not an ancient gateway because that statue was still standing a few hundred years ago. Where on earth can we find the picture of the Palace of Byzantium? It's still here, of course, in its imitations, in echoes of the great palace of Constantinople that stand in Sicily and Spain, in Syria and Rome. Villas, gardens, and verandas, all set like tents across the hill. Scented courtyards, splashing fountains, a world that ordinary people never saw. Some of their very stones were plundered from the golden palace of Byzantium. There were churches too, filled with the holiest of relics. Fragments of the true cross set in gold and blood red rubies and great jeweled cups made for the Emperor's own communion. And at the heart, at the very centre of this magic palace, Byzantium's throne room, the throne room of the Emperor of Christendom. As you approach the imperial throne of Byzantium, you have felt as naked as a man on Judgment Day, utterly defenceless. The man who sat on that chair didn't rule by the will of God. He was the will of God on earth. He was God's instrument. He was divine providence personified. Some Byzantines believed that the end of world history would come when that man on that throne took his crown off and laid it on the rock of Calvary. It's probably the most total form of government the world has ever seen. You don't have, for example, participatory government in this. Who can participate in the will of God? You can only bow before it. You can't have morality or loyalty. You can't have good kings or bad kings. Because who can know the workings of the will of this astonishing emperor? That is Byzantine politics. Byzantium 
ruled with cosmic certainty. It didn't dominate its neighbors with vast armies, but with images of God and government, with bars of gold and promises of princesses in marriage and alliance, all dressed up in the silk robes of Byzantium. The Byzantines operated a kind of cultural imperialism. And at the center of the show was Constantinople, the golden palace and its emperor, the rituals of its church and court. In the 10th century, diplomats and merchants, Easterners and Westerners, all give astonishing descriptions of a weekly procession that wound through the cloisters and the gardens of the palace, all filled with singing choirs, and ran up to the great church of St. Sophia. Behold the morning star, they sang, as the emperor approached. In his eyes, the sun's rays are reflected. Adore him, ye nations, bow the neck to his greatness. The whole world agreed that this was the most magnificent, the most awe-inspiring sight on earth. At its ending, the procession passed up a wooden walkway that ran right up to the gallery of the great church and entered St. Sophia through this door. Here, high up in the gallery of St. Sophia, was the chapel of the emperors and the court. Below the balcony, in the incense and darkness of the ancient church, pilgrims from Asia, Africa and Europe visited and kissed a thousand holy relics, a little holy land of marble, gold and bronze. In this smaller private space above, the emperors held courtly services and were enrobed for the vast ceremonials that took place each week in the church below. And here they are still, the dynasties of old Byzantium, still walking in the grand procession from a thousand years ago. That's the Emperor John the Good up there, all decked out in his Sunday best and carrying a bag of gold for the church. He was a good king. He was from the Comagene family. It was a noble dynasty, died out in 1185. That's his wife, Irene. She was a Hungarian princess. See, she's got blonde hair. And that poor little weedy chap round the corner is their son, Alexis. John desperately wanted him to succeed to the throne, but he died young. That person there is the most celebrated, most married monarch of the Macedonian dynasty, the Empress Zoe. Zoe ruled Byzantium in her own right in the 1050s. Zoe also had royal blood in her veins, and she legitimized three successive husbands as emperors. That's the last of them, the pious Constantine IX. If you look closely, you can see that the head of that figure's been changed. I bet there were portraits of her other two husbands underneath. Now, the funny thing about this mosaic is that Zoe's portrait's been changed along with her husband's, too. You know, some historians have said that she was very vain, certain she was beloved of the people of Constantinople who thought her very beautiful. And you know, she was almost 60 when that portrait was made. In the year 987, Russian ambassadors came south into the sun to see Byzantium. They told their prince the ambitious Prince of Kiev, that they couldn't begin to describe the splendor of Saint Sophia. They could only say that God dwelt here within it, and they were all baptized. Just as it intended, 
Byzantium had dominated its neighbors with pious splendor and magnificence. These Russians, though, were tough and warlike. Despite their newfound faith, they still hovered dangerously on Byzantium's northern borders. Rather than dispatch grand armies to subdue them, the Byzantines employed images of God and government. They built churches in Central Europe, the like of which the Northerners had never seen. And sometimes, too, the Byzantines sent bishops and ambassadors, men laden with wisdom, relics, and the word of God. The Byzantines didn't like to travel north in the winter. The diplomats had to go sometimes, little bars of gold stamped with the emperor's name, wrapped in furs and stuffed under the sledge out of the way, the gold to bribe local chieftains to attack one another rather than to go and attack Constantinople. It was a terrifying journey. First of all, you went through a Byzantine border fort. There the governor tried to grab a few of the sons of the local princes to keep them under control. And then you set out across the icy wastes. When you met some villages, you might give them some silk, brocade, or pepper, or leather. But always, out there are shadows hiding in the woods. The Pechenegs. These were ancient tribesmen who really prided themselves on killing travellers who drank from their gold-bound skulls and hung from the walls of their tent, so it was said. After months of travel, you'd arrive at the side of the frozen river Dnieper, and look up at the great fortress of the ruler of Kiev, the prince of the Varangian Rus. Before Byzantium, the princes of Kiev had all lived in wooden huts. These towers and domes and all the dreams they hold came here from old Byzantium. And the story of their making is an extraordinary tale. This little area here was once the center of Kievan Rus, a little stockade just 600 yards across. Now, you've got to think, it's the year 988. There's Prince Vladimir, a Byzantine bishop, and a lot of Byzantine craftsmen are coming out here. It's just before dawn. It's very cold. And at a particular holy moment, after a prayer is said, they plant the position of the altar. And then, as the sun comes up and a shadow is cast across the snow, a nobleman called Simon, so tradition tells us, took off a golden belt and they measured out 20 golden belt lengths. And that would be the first church in Vladimir's kingdom. It's an astonishing moment in history. It's the old technology of Greece and Rome, a thousand years after those empires are gone, going into parts of the world that they had never managed to conquer. Vladimir's church is gone now. There's still a few bits of the floor left, though. Some precious relics of a tremendous Byzantine achievement. <coughs> Jacquery, Jacquery. You know, it's at times like this, archaeology really comes alive. Look, this isn't just a little of a bit of brick or mortar or something. These are the first bricks ever laid in Central Europe. It's not just stone on stone either. This is like somebody 
got into a Cadillac and drove it into the middle of the Amazon and parked it in a village where nobody had ever seen outside people before. This is astonishing. Look, it's only a bit of ceramic and a bit of mortar. You need two separate kiln masters with two separate kilns for that. They have to find the lime to make the mortar. They have to go to the river to find the clay down the road here. They have to build their kilns, cut the trees, and then they got them cutting stone, local stone, hewn from open quarries for the first time. The Russians didn't like working stone. There's an old Russian proverb. It is easier to teach an ill-tempered wife than it is to cut stone. But actually, their real problem was the weather. It was truly terrible. It was either freezing, freezing cold, and they complained bitterly that it was so difficult to lay bricks in fur-lined coats and mittens. And then when it thawed, this area was under a mass of mud, and they had to devise incredibly elaborate wooden structures to hold the building up at all when they extended the foundations. So this is an extraordinary enterprise. How ingenious those people were coming from the south. How determined it took them eight years to get this place up. They learnt, though, the next time, they build a church in five years. This is the church they built, the Cathedral of St. Sophia of Kiev. Beneath the old Ukrainian domes, Byzantine brick and ancient Greek geometry. These could be the walls of an imperial church in ancient Constantinople. Inside, memories of the palace of all palaces and the church of all churches, the original Saint Sophia of Constantinople. and gleaming mosaics too, made by Byzantine craftsmen sent here to work for Vladimir's son, Prince Yaroslav. Carefully preserved images of Jesus, Mary and the saints, images of government and holiness to pacify the north. The heavenly court of old Byzantium, floating high above the Prince of Kiev. It's a heavenly court, now entirely mirrored in Yaroslav's new court on earth. Aided and abetted by a Byzantine bishop who wants him to punish sinners, to feed the poor, and to fight the enemies of Byzantium. But there's something else going on in this wondrous building. Something else yet more subtle. It's like a soap opera here. It imparts manner, it imparts gesture. It shows you the Byzantine way of walking and talking. And between that fierce structure and this new manner, the old order of Rus was entirely swept away. But you know, despite all that, the Byzantines never really trusted the Rus. They did have worried, though. The Russians had learnt their lesson very, very well indeed. And centuries later, when Constantinople itself had been thrown away, when Constantinople, the second Rome, had gone, then Moscow, the new capital of the Rus, declared itself as the third Rome. Just as the dangerous northern tribes passed under Byzantium's golden spell, so did its southern European neighbours in Greece and Italy and the islands of the Mediterranean. Venice, that ancient little town set on the mud banks of a North Italian salt marsh, was the owner of a powerful fleet of warships, as much a menace to Constantinople as were the tribesmen of the north. Beneath the stones of Venice, then, the bricks and columns, the technology and arts of old Byzantium. Just like Kiev, Venice's first churches and its most powerful images of God and government all came here from Byzantium. This was the old Venetian's single most powerful portrait of the face of God. 
the parlor door made for the high altar of St. Mark's. It's a funny old thing, actually. It's cobbled up from all sorts of things. Gold strips, bits of jewellery, it's all there. Like a magpie's nest. The single most beautiful things about this is these wonderful plaques of enamel. They're Byzantine imports. They were made in the imperial workshops in the year 1105, and they're probably copied from the decorations of a chapel in the imperial palace of Constantinople. That's Christ in the center. All around him, and all in order, large to small, is laid out the court of heaven, just as Byzantium's foreign kings and princes decorated the emperor's court of Constantinople. If you were a useful ally for Byzantium and you sent off 30 or 40 pounds of gold to Constantinople with a humble letter, the emperor might just honor you with some of these panels, pictures of God and your local saints and portraits too of you amongst the golden prophets and the angels of Byzantium. This was the power of Byzantium abroad, its prestige, its foreign policy. This little chap here is Ordolafo Falia, the ruler, the doge of Venice. He's the man who commissioned the greater part of the Paladoro. Now this is where you can start to see something of that provincial envy of Byzantium starting to work. That envy that almost rose up and threatened to destroy the great imperial empire. Look, I'll show you what I mean. There's the man, there's the Virgin Mary, and there you would expect the man's wife. But it isn't his wife, it is the Empress Irene of Byzantium. So what's going on here? Well, I think the Venetians have sort of rejigged it. So the dear old Doge of Venice, who by Constantinople and rights was a, a minor official on the edge of empire, suddenly popped up as, a, you know, married to the great empress. They've also, the Venetians, cunning devils, given him a halo. You see, they've soldered a whole new head on there. The Byzantines would never have sent a figure of a local ruler with a halo on, so he's sort of really bumped up in the holy hierarchy here. But there's one thing the Venetians missed, and this is quite funny, because rulers in a celestial universe wear red socks. The Virgin Mary has red socks, the Empress has red socks, all the kings on this have red socks. But poor old Ordolafio doesn't. So he isn't really at the top of Byzantium's holy hierarchy. You don't think that's important? Ordolafo would have done. Deep down, he knew that the great Byzantine god that ordered everything within this Christian universe had seen that dubious halo. Also, that this same god held the power of eternal life and death. By the Middle Ages, Byzantium's most powerful images of God and government had crossed the Mediterranean and penetrated Central Europe too. And always at the very heart of this Christian universe was the golden emperor of Byzantium and the glittering city of Constantinople. What did that legendary city really look like? In modern Istanbul, one single precious district of the city still holds something of the air of ancient Constantinople buried underneath it. Part built from the stones of the city's ancient marketplaces, Istanbul's bazaars still stand in Byzantium's thin streets. That old electric mix of races and religions, trades and professions is still here as well, just as it was a thousand years ago. Oh my God. What are they then? Monsieur, Monsieur, Turkche, Suluk. 
Filho, lentes. Lentes. Yes, lentes. Lentes. Sir, clean your shoes, clean your blood. Doctor, exama. Excellent. Exama. Romatisma, romatisma. That's amazing. Oh, Byzantine leeches. Yes. It's good for everything. Yes. Set between the east and west, Constantinople was the world's great marketplace, a living legend. Goods from Byzantium's bazaars are found today in excavations in Sweden and Afghanistan, in England and in Russia. And like Coke cans in the Gobi Desert, they give out a very special buzz. Something for your constipation? Henna for your fingernails? And come in. Everything the Byzantines had. Sultanas. Bet they didn't call it that. In Byzantium, women mostly made the deals. Nowadays, though, the traders here are men. Baltic amber, African gold and ivory, Asian gemstones, Eastern silks and spices, and multinational traders, Italians mostly, buying and selling everything you could think of. There were fortunes to be made out of Byzantium. You know, the weavers, the great silk bazaars of Byzantium have been famous for centuries upon centuries. In the West, they just had little bits of Byzantine silk and they used it to wrap the bones of saints and to put upon the high altars of cathedrals. So you can imagine that when a Western diplomat came here about 950 AD and actually bought two whole rolls of silk to, for his own clothes and he was very pleased with himself, but when the bishop got to the borders, the customs, the Byzantine customs, took the cloth away from him. They said that even great Bishop Louis Prand of Cremona, embassy of the King of Germany, wasn't grand enough to wear this fine fabric. You know, the Byzantines had a knack of making great kings feel like little lads from the country. The old bazaars had ancient wisdom up for sale as well. In Byzantium's book market, the best part of the learning of the ancient world was copied out by publishers and merchants. And here it is still today, the oldest bookstore in the world. You know, this is an amazing place. Just think, 600 years ago, there was a very famous Arab travel writer and he was coming through here, rummaging about in the bazaar looking for books. Ibn Battuta, he was called. Anyway, there he was, rummaging around. There would have been more people here then, lots of scribes actually writing them. And a Byzantine magistrate who was walking through the square recognised him. And the old two men got together, the Arab and the Christian, and they sat down and they talked about writing books. They talked about travel and the joys of scholarship. Westerners really love the book bazaar in Byzantium. They could find things there that were real legends. Magical lost works like this, for example. This is a copy, Greek copy, of an ancient work made in Alexandria by an ancient Greek. It concerns the workings of the universe. Westerners only knew this from the talk of learned Arabs. Now, after visiting the bazaar, they could actually own a copy of Ptolemy's Algamist. Books like the Algamist gave algebra and chemistry to Western Europe. To Westerners, it must have seen that all the wealth and wisdom of the world was held inside Constantinople and in the houses of the lucky people of Byzantium. The Byzantines lived in a very face-to-face -face community. It was a very tight, enclosed world. 
They were incredibly superstitious, always looking for signs as they looked at each other, things that might change the meaning of their relationships with one another. The angle of a man's shoulders could tell you if he was having an affair. If you had a dream that you'd put on a pair of shoes and weren't going anywhere, it meant you might be getting married. You could nod at a woman and it meant that you would be having an affair with her very shortly. Superstitions everywhere. They divine the future by listening to thunder, but above all, they love charms and trinkets, things you can buy in bazaars, glittering treasures, and this, that is the greatest charm of all. It's been around for thousands of years before Byzantium, and it'll go on for a thousand years beyond us all. It's a charm against the evil eye. The evil eye, of course, is envy. That thing that's so destructive inside small communities was so destructive for Constantinople, too. Constantinople was called the eye of all the world. Everybody envied its gold and silk and pretty princesses. Not everybody, though, was allowed a glimpse of heaven. Poor old Bishop Louis Prand of Cremona, who'd come to Constantinople for silks and for a Byzantine princess for his prince, hadn't got either of them. The Byzantines had lectured him upon the gross behaviour of his prince and sniffed at the very idea of sending an imperial princess to such a barbarous and distant kingdom. Louis Pran greatly resented these haughty Byzantines, especially the great warrior emperor, Nicephorus Phocas, who came to the throne in 963. You wouldn't want to meet him on a dark night, Bishop Louis Prand reports to his prince. He's a monstrosity in a smelly old robe, a dwarf with the eyes of a mole, disfingered, disgraced, pig-like, an Ethiopian. Every week, Louis Pran continues, like some crawling monster, the emperor walks in procession to the great church, and the singers cry, behold, the morning star approaches. They might just as well sing, come on, you burnout old coal, old woman, clod-hobbing barbarian. As Western diplomats like Louis Pran reported on the weakness of the emperors and on the thousand years of treasure in their city, so Western Europe's princes grew ever stronger, ever more powerful, and ever more envious of Byzantium. In 1204, the Venetians managed to divert a cutthroat army of crusaders from their sacred vows to capture Palestine for Christendom, promising them the plunder of Byzantium. They provided lists of the treasures and the holy relics inside Constantinople. On the 13th of April, Venetian war galleys sailed up to the city walls and the knights of France and Germany, of Italy and England, jumped from the boats onto the battlements. The campaign that followed was a nasty mix of treachery and chaos. At the ending, the city's walls were breached and the imperial throne was overturned. Many Byzantine nobles fled here to the palace of Black and I, where they were besieged by Henry, the noble prince of Flanders. Now the Venetians knew exactly what was in this palace. They even had an inventory of its contents. And when the nobles gave up the fight, they took everything they could out of the building. Gold, silver, precious jewels, silk, satins, ermine, minerva. The hall was tremendous. More booty, it said, was taken from this town than from all the cities since creation. Over the next 50 years, half of Constantinople was boxed up, crated, and shipped out of the city to Venice and the West.
At the very heart of Venice, between the State Palace and St. Mark's, the old state church, is the city's ancient treasury. And the root of that treasure was the plunder of Byzantium. It was Europe's pawn shop, really. Emperors left their crowns here for cash. The King of France actually bought the crown of thorns from this room. And in the 1790s, when Napoleon and his armies turned up in Italy, he was able to take half a ton of gold from this room and melt it down just to pay his troops. But despite all of that, despite all the losses, this is still the single place in all the world when you can get a glimmer, just a flash, of the treasure that once filled Byzantium. A glass bowl, enameled with classic images, taken from the emperor's own quarters in the palace. From the palace chapels, the cups of the imperial communion. A golden icon of St. Michael, studded with Indian emeralds. The Byzantines used its glowing colors to foretell the future. This too came from the palace, probably from the chambers of a queen. Inside St. Mark's as well, the altars filled with the holy relics looted from Constantinople. This superb Madonna, Venice's most holy icon, had been carried into battle by the Emperor Alexis Mozuflos. The Venetians tore it from his abandoned war chariot. It's not just the inside of St. Mark's that filled with the plunder of Byzantium. The whole outside of the cathedral is covered in stone stripped from the churches of Constantinople and shipped by the Venetian navy. A great new balcony was built from the stones of old Byzantium and four bronze horses said to have come from the very heart of Constantinople were set up high upon it. St. Mark's was plated with the plunder of Byzantium. Today, the old brick church has all but disappeared beneath the foreign marble. Shiploads of columns from Constantinople now decorate the doorways of the church. These beautiful square pillars from an ancient church that had stood on the main highway of Constantinople were used as gallows. The Venetians hung criminals from them. Other fragments of this lost masterpiece once stood in crusader chapels from Spain to Austria. This is an interesting piece. It has an amazing history. You see, when the Venetians first took the sculpture from the boat, they found that one of the feet had been broken off. So they made a new foot out of a lighter, whiter stone. You see that? Now, just a few years ago in Istanbul, a Turkish archaeologist actually dug up the original foot. So now we know where this sculpture came from. It came from a monument of Constantine the Great, the first king of Byzantium. And those are his four sons. Think of that. We have bits and pieces here from all ages, all styles. This stone is from Egypt. Others are from Syria, from Greece. All that style, that richness that went into Byzantium then has gone to make the city of Venice itself. Byzantium didn't just make Venice beautiful. All the courts of Western Europe now held the plunder of Constantinople. Objects whose hypnotic sparkle crackled through Western Europe. In modern Germany, 
The little town of Limburg still holds one of these most alien objects. A piece of the cross on which Christ was crucified, transformed by a Byzantine into one of the world's great jewels, and then carried off to Germany by Heinrich von Ullmann, the crusading knight. In 1235, when this church was just being finished and the Crusaders were still ruling in Constantinople, that doorway would have been surrounded by the ill, the mad, and the crippled, and the poor. They weren't just standing there waiting for handouts. What was going on was something rather unusual. Inside this church, inside all churches in Western Europe where there was a relic of a saint, there was a special power. This power came actually from heaven. And in lieu of hospitals, that was the best thing these people would hope for was a cure. After all, Jesus had cured the poor. Now, saints were denominated as holy men by two things, by the actions of their lives and by the fact that their bodies didn't decay. So the little fragments of bone and flesh were very important. When people went up to their shrines and touched them, they were in touch, you might say, with a little bit of heaven as if there was a hole in the holy ozone you could reach up through heaven through the words of the priests and the incense and the music and some of these blessings could rain down upon you the relics of Byzantium though weren't relics of local saints they'd been brought from the Holy Land they were the personal possessions some of the very things that Jesus and Mary had touched and they were never used to cure the poor These holy things were held in the imperial churches and in the palaces of Byzantium. In that extraordinary world, halfway between earth and heaven, they confirmed the divine role of the emperor on earth. By stealing these powerful objects from Constantinople, the pious kings of Western Europe had gained a confidence they'd never had before. This then, that taking of the relics was the taking of the holiness of the divine right of kings, the beginning of Western Europe, of Eurocentricity, and almost, you might say, of the modern world. Back at Constantinople, the Crusaders' colonial administration failed. The knights couldn't balance the books. Driven by debts and petty wars, they left for home. On August the 15th, in the year 1260, a new emperor, Michael VIII, walked in solemn procession through the ancient gates, dressed in the imperial robes of silk and gold, with his choirs, his soldiers and all his priests. Safe inside, he addressed the adoring people of the city who'd labored under foreign rule for 50 years and now celebrated the return of Christ's true emperor to the very center of the earth. A while ago, God was angry with us and made the west into a great wind that blew us from our city and we lived like the birds beneath the branches of a tree. But just as he'd promised Abraham the promised land, just as he granted my ancestors eternal victory, so he has given me back the sacred city. Michael might have thought that God had put Byzantium back into the center of the cosmos. The truth was, the Crusaders had wrecked Constantinople, plundered it, broken it, destroyed it and the Emperor's return to great power politics was suicidal. Michael and his Byzantines didn't know that though. As Michael said, they thought that God had restored the cosmic balance, that the golden dream was up and running as before. In the Imperial Chapel, in the gallery of Saint Sophia. Their artists made a celebratory mosaic for the Emperor's return. Jesus, Mary, and Saint John the Baptist. You'd think the world had never changed. Just 20 feet away, 
The stone is said to mark the grave of the Venetian who led the Western armies to Constantinople. Enricus Dandolo, the man who broke Byzantium. His bones, they said, were thrown out the window into the street, and even the dogs wouldn't eat them. The great mosaic, though, humane, transcendent, optimistic, is the finest single work of all Byzantium's mosaic masters. See how it takes the light. The court of heaven shimmers in the church. This is the Christ the Byzantines had always worshipped. Not a Western Christ upon a cross impaled in dismal earthly history, but the old Eastern Christ, Christ of all times and of all places, Christ of the palace, Christ of Kiev and of Venice, Christ, Lord of Byzantium. The same Christ, too, whose relics and whose images now filled the churches and imagination of the West. The Christ whose soft, impassive face would watch his Eastern Empire gently fade away. This is the story of the ending of a civilization, of the breaking of a way of life. The story of a nation facing extinction and of the choices that its people made. The story of the ending of the empire of Byzantium and of the beginnings of the modern world. The last years of the Empire of Byzantium were filled with stress and beauty. Faced with enemies, looking for friends, and always waiting for the ending. As it fell, Byzantium's ornaments, its arts and peoples settled on the west like sparks from a burning forest. Sparks that lit the Western world. I'm standing high above the Golden Horn in Istanbul, in modern Turkey. I'm standing right on the edge of Europe, too. That's Asia over there. Now, 800 years ago, from here to the Great Blue Sea was the most famous palace in the world. Its wealth, its beauty, its sacredness was the envy of people from Iceland to China. Only the angels in heaven, the Byzantines had said, knew the date of the ending of this dazzling city, the capital of the Empire of Byzantium, which they called Constantinople. 
Late in the Middle Ages, though, in the last two centuries of Byzantium, when the Crusaders had half destroyed the city, and with the armies of the Turkish sultans closing in upon its walls, you didn't need to be an angel to know the end was very close. The broken empire of Byzantium prepared to face its destiny. The emperors moved their palace here to Vlachanai, right on the city walls. Here they could face all their enemies, the Turks, the Westerners. Here too was a great church and a most sinister prison where half a dozen emperors were executed or blinded in terrifying family feuds. Just like the emperors, Jesus, Mary and all the saints had also moved out onto the city walls. This is the great monastery church of Saint Saviour in Cora, Saint Saviour in the fields. In the last centuries of Byzantium, the city's greatest icons were in this church, waiting to be paraded round the walls in times of siege. Saint Saviour's was Byzantium's last masterwork, the jewel box set beside the city walls. Inside these little city churches, many people found their individual answers to the most terrible dilemma that any culture has to face, the threat of annihilation, of the death of a nation. The imperial crown was stored here alongside the holy pictures. It's said that on the last night of Byzantium, on the 28th of May, 1453, as the Emperor Constantine Paleologus was praying, the Virgin Mary came down from heaven and asked him to return the crown to her as God withdrew protection from his holy city. Above the door in shining gold, an image of the church's greatest benefactor, Theodore Metachites, Prime Minister and High Chancellor of Byzantium. Look at him with his turban and his caftan. The very model of an Eastern gentleman. Yet Theodore and the Byzantines were a very ancient people the living remnants of the world of Greece and Rome. Even by Theodore's day though, by the 1320s, the great chancellor had come to the conclusion that Byzantium's ancient heritage was quite exhausted. That all one really had to do was to wait and pray and silently endure. His church is a meditation on eternity. Theodore's artists have given us one of Byzantium's finest images, perhaps one of the greatest paintings ever made. I say that because it's a painting about humanity, about the value of humankind. Look what's going on. That's Christ in the middle, resplendent white. He's burst through the gates of hell. He's got the hands of Adam and Eve, that's all of us, and he's pulling them from the grave. It's the hands. Look at the hands. It's the hands that's got the urgency in them. The hands that are insisting upon this resurrection, not from earthly empires, but from the value of humankind itself. It was those ideals that drove Byzantium in his final years. The idea that like the kingdom of heaven, Byzantium was not a kingdom of this world. It was a belief in the inevitability that the world came, had a beginning and would come to an end. So when the emperor went onto the walls and took with him the most ancient icons of his faith and knew that he would die, he also knew that he was right.
Many Byzantines believed that if an enemy ever broke through these vast old city walls, the very statues of the ancient emperors would come alive and drive the invaders from the city. For them, Constantinople was a sacred city, the center of the world, inviolable. Yet they too could see the Turkish armies drawing ever closer and their ancient city descending into ruin. By the 1400s, many of Byzantium's brightest minds had left the gathering gloom and darkness of the crumbling city and settled in a fresh new town beneath the mountain tops of southern Greece. A sparkling town on a hilltop close to the ruins of ancient Sparta, a town called Mistra. A miniature kingdom ruled by the emperor's brother Theodore and Queen Cleope, his Italian wife, where Jews and Greeks, Byzantines and Italians, Greek and Latin could live happily together. One of the lovely things about Mistra is how small it is, how tiny, how human. Everything here is democratic. As you walk down the street, you'd have bumped into everybody. You might have seen Italian merchants. You might have seen beautiful Queen Cleope walking amongst the flowers. And you might have seen the retired Emperor John here to visit his family, now a monk buzzing busily from church to church. At the hub of Mistra's life was a charismatic teacher from Constantinople, a follower of Plato, the ancient Greek philosopher, a man called Plethon. In Plethon's time, Mistra was already famous. It was a little paradise, they said. The men were handsome, the women were beautiful, and the stones were from ancient Sparta itself. But everybody knew that they were doomed. Here, Plethon founded the last academy of Greek philosophy. Here, he taught future patriarchs of Constantinople and future cardinals of the Church of Rome as well. As they mingled with the philosophers of late Byzantium, for a brief while, Western visitors to Mistra witnessed the last flowering of the living world of ancient Greece. This is the estate of a grand Byzantine nobleman. Not much left of the garden, just a few wild herbs and a little spinach. But you know, Plethon must have lived in a house like this. It really corresponds to the old philosopher's way of thinking about things. Upstairs, the noble family. Downstairs, the servants and the animals. The third class would have been the merchant classes. Lived in a bit of a smaller house. But this, this is grand. Look at the fireplace. Great big flue going up through the wood ceiling and the tiles to the outside. Just like a modern fireplace with a big canopy coming down the front. Those two holes there supporting the wood that held the cooking chain would have hung right down there with a big pot on it with two great stones underneath. Everything was cooked there. If they wanted to roast anything, they'd send it out to a local bread oven. Now, all the rest of the activity of this house went on in one big room. What you've got to think of here is little cubicles with curtains around. The lavatory, the beds, any little private areas that people wanted. This was a very simple life because these were the leading men of Byzantium. Plethon was very proud of it. He said that even great Queen Cleopatra herself, who would have lived in a house like this, actually had given up the soft and decadent ways of the Italians and taken up our own innocent behaviour, he said. So you've got to think, old Plethon, sitting perhaps in the evening light, looking out over the Vale of Sparta, what would he have done? Well, he scribbled letters to the Duke. Plethon was very worried about the condition of Byzantium. He thought the world needed reformation, and he came up with all these amazing ideas from ancient Greece. He was a bit of an old fascist, really. A lot of his ideas were terrible, but he was a magnetic character. People loved him. Like all professors, they loved listening to him and didn't take a word of notice of what he said.
at the heart of Nistra was the court. And at the heart of the court, this little pretty church, named after the great old court church of Constantinople, St. Sophia. There's not much left here now. Just Christ up there on the wall and a few beautiful fragments of marble. Most of the church has been stripped out completely. There's even a little double-headed eagle still up there, the double-headed eagle of the last emperors of Byzantium. But the real treasure is here on the floor. Look at this. See that? That stone there, that purple stone, that's imperial porphyry. That's a stone, well, it's the half magical stone of Byzantium. When this church was built, it hadn't even been mined for a thousand years. Yet yeah, little chippings of it were taken around the world and set in floors like this. It was the stone in which Roman emperors had been born in rooms that were covered in it. This, though, was probably the very stone where the last emperor of Byzantium was crowned. Constantine Paleologus, the last ruler of Mystra, was crowned here on the 6th of January, 1449. Three years later, he died fighting on the walls of Constantinople as the Turks took the city. In the 13th century, a family of nomad Turkish shepherds called the Ottomans packed their tents and rode out of Central Asia. Two centuries later, the Islamic armies of the Ottoman Turks, commanded by members of that same family, had conquered most of the territory of Byzantium and a large part of Southeast Europe too. The center of this enlarging Turkish empire was a city at the borders of modern Greece and Turkey, the city of Edirne, the capital of the Turkish sultans. In those days, Edirne was a hectic international city, the city of great mosques, hospitals, concert halls, munitions works, and grand bazaars. This is one of the colleges of learning at Edirne. In Sultan Mehmet's time, there were many of them here, and they formed a circle like a university around the court. It was an international university. There were Italians here teaching the Sultan's children how to speak Greek. Byzantine nobles sometimes sent their children here for a good education. Old Plethon came here as a young man. Here it was, he met Persian fire worshippers who taught him all about their strange religion. Here it was, too. He first read the works of the ancient Greek Aristotle. Clearly, this dynamic, international, rich, powerful society was far more than a match for the poor old empire of Byzantium. It was also clear that the ancient city of Constantinople had been engulfed by this adolescent multinational empire, that Constantinople lay at the strategic center of its trade routes, and on the supply lines of the Turkish armies that were eating into Eastern Europe. That is why Byzantium was doomed. In 1438, the Emperor John VIII sailed out of Constantinople in a last attempt to beg aid from the reluctant West in his struggle with the Turks. After 77 days at sea, the Imperial Convoy arrived at the friendly port of Venice. The West had always said that military aid for Constantinople was dependent upon Byzantium's reunion with the Church of Rome. 
the churches of the East and West, Greek and Latin, had split apart six centuries before. So the Emperor John had sailed with his theologians and his bishops, not his generals or his admirals. In all, some 700 people on the sea, the scholars of Byzantium. Plethon, too, had come especially from Nistra in Greece, as had many of his pupils. The most extraordinary thing about this gathering, that there were bishops and priests from all the cities of the ancient East, all the cities founded by Greece and Rome, the cities of Alexander the Great, the cities of the Seven Wonders of the World, all had their representatives at the Council, all at once and all together. It was as if the old world had come to meet the new. But there was plague abroad in northern Italy. Two Byzantine bishops perished in the first weeks of negotiations. The emperor and his retinue rode away from danger, over the mountains and down to the central plain of Italy. Here, perhaps, at Florence, they might forge that union with the West that Byzantium so desperately needed. And here, too, they were memorialized in the frescoes of Bonozzo Gozzoli, painted in the townhouse of the Medici family, the bankers who were sponsoring this Council of the Churches. That's John VIII, John Paleologus from Nistra, Emperor of Byzantium, come to the West to seek aid. He'd ruled 12 years at this point. And when he got here, the Florentines, those dedicated followers of fashion, thought he was a knockout. They had never seen turbans like that or crowns like that. The jewelers liked it. The, the Florentine weavers liked it, the painters liked it. This was a man whose dress and demeanor influenced fashion here almost for a century. They didn't like him much, though. They thought all the Greeks were haughty, sarcastic people who seemed to be laughing at jokes that they wouldn't share with the Florentines. Didn't like them at all, really. What they were experiencing, actually, was a typical Greek thing. It was the full force of the divine right of kings. See, in the West that had rather diminished, the West that had pinched the idea of the emperor had now taken to electing Western emperors. They were confirmed by popes. There was common law, power in the West that seeped down and down and down away from the man who now was like only at the top of a vast pyramid of power. In Byzantium, everything resided in the one man. Now, in the West, and here it is, out for a stroll in the country. Cosimo and the other 700 Medici, all on their horses. This is entirely reversed. I mean, here you've got a man who is a banker, a politician, a multinational businessman, you might say. The West was entirely different. The central disagreement, then, was about these different attitudes to power in East and West about power and precedence amongst the lords of earth and heaven. Most of the Byzantines, though, were insulted at the very idea of arguing about God, whose majesty and dignity was beyond all human understanding. They thought that the clever Roman clerics they faced each day were simply impertinent and immature. After a year of recrimination and debate, the Emperor John, still desperate for military aid, simply ordered his delegation to agree to most of the West's arguments. On the 6th of June, 1439, a great act of union was signed in Florence Cathedral, right under the huge, beautiful, brand new dome. An act of union between two churches, between the Pope of Rome and his assembled clergy, the Emperor of Byzantium, and whichever of his Greeks decided to turn up that day.
The real buzz in Florence, though, wasn't in the great cathedral. It was in the streets. The Byzantines were here. These weren't the old school teachers that rich Florentines paid to teach their kids. These were the geniuses, the brightest minds of Byzantium. And here they were carrying all the wisdom of the ancient world, it seemed. Now, the brightest of all these Greeks was Plethon. He taught practically all the people in the Greek delegation. He came straight from mystery. He was very old. He was 80. And he was as charismatic as ever. He gave lectures here, and the effect was amazing. Back at Constantinople, though, the union with Rome caused riots. Italian priests were insulted in the city's churches, and Western Europe sent no aid. Disillusioned, disappointed, the Emperor John died a few years later and was buried here in the monastery of Christ Pantocrator, Christ, Lord of Earth and Heaven. And at this same monastery, Gennadius, the theologian, preached that the union with Rome would bring down the wrath of God upon Byzantium. Meanwhile, at Edirne, a new young Turkish sultan, Mehmet, had taken up the Ottoman throne. For Constantinople, the new emperor, John's brother, Constantine, soon discovered that he now had a dangerous and most impatient neighbour. In April 1452, there was a huge row at the court of Sultan Mehmet II. Byzantine ambassadors had turned up complaining that the young man was breaking all his father's treaties. He was to. He was building a huge castle right next door to Constantinople called the Cutthroat. It was the first stages in his planned attack upon the city. And now, in his reply to these ambassadors, he tried to scare the pants on. Listen to this. These are his very words. Have you the right or the power to control my actions on my own territory? Inform your king that I am very different from my father, that my resolution surpasses all my ancestors. This time, you can return in safety, but the next man who delivers a similar message to me will be flayed alive. Back in Constantinople, the new emperor, Constantine XI, reluctantly composed his reply. It is clear, he said to the Sultan, that you desire war more than peace. So let that be your desire. I release you from all your oaths and treaties with me, and in closing the gates of my city, I tell you I will defend my people to the last drop of blood. The Turkish mosques in Byzantium were shut. The Turkish troops who were sightseeing in the city were thrown out the gates. Byzantium was at war. Mehmet was actually very touched by Constantine. After all, the Ottomans and Byzantines had lived side by side for a very long time. They'd fought together in wars, they'd intermarried. But Mehmet was also very determined. Listen to his reply. I shall take your city, he tells Constantine, or the city will take me. If, however, you admit defeat and withdraw, I will give you Mistra and its province, and we shall be friends. If you deny me peaceful entry, however, I shall slay you and all your nobles. I shall slaughter the inhabitants of your city and allow my troops to plunder it. The city itself is all I want, even if it is empty. Constantine's reply was brief. You may have anything you want of me other than the city. I will not flee from it, nor will I evacuate it. You may have anything but the city. For the city, I would rather die than live.
On the evening of the 28th, the Sultan Mehmet addressed his armies standing assembled outside the city walls. I give you, he said, the capital of the ancient Romans, the summit of power and glory, the center of the world. I give over to you the men, women, and children of this city. It's gold and silver, it's silks and furs. All I want are the buildings and the walls. It really was the standard offer of a medieval commander to his troops before the final assault. And they roared in agreement. There is but one God, they said, and Muhammad is his prophet. On the fringe of empire, high in the mountains of northern Romania, contemporary Byzantine artists made precious records of the fall of Constantinople. Here's the Turkish armies, waiting for Mehmet to order the final assault upon the city. The cannons, large as dragons, it was said, brought down from Edirne to pulverize the city's vast old walls. The Turkish navy, fighting all along the Golden Horn, forcing the tiny armies of the Byzantines to fight on two fronts at once. On the city walls, the Byzantines parade the holy icon of the Virgin, the city's sacred shield just as they had done for a thousand years and more. Every hole, each crack and weakness in the ancient walls was strengthened by the prayers of priests, the women and the children. There's the emperor, ordering the walls repair with rocks and stones. And the empress too, with her ladies. Here though, the artist is in error. There was no queen. Constantine XI, Constantine of Mistra, was childless and a widower. The last emperor would leave no heir. On the last day of Byzantium, an eerie quiet fell over the city. Mehmet had told the Turks to rest for a whole day before the last assault. He gave the emperor time to walk with all that was left of the armies of nobles of Byzantium once again into the great church. And there, after all their arguing at Florence, the Greeks and the Latins joined together in a last service and the emperor went to the altar and was given the last rites. Then he walked back to the palace and there he made a speech to his commanders. A speech, you might say, it was the last speech of the ancient world. He encouraged them not to be frightened when the Turks attacked. He said that their ancestors, the ancient Romans, were terrified when Hannibal's elephants had charged towards them. That they hadn't run away. Because they were human beings, people with will and mind, and not given to animal desires, and that he and his commanders had mind and will and God and belief upon their side. It was those beliefs of mind that stem back to Greece and Rome and fuel the modern world. And then Constantine, the eleventh of that name, went with his men back to the outskirts of his empire, to the walls now of his city. And there he died, the ruler of Rome, the king of Christendom, and the emperor of Byzantium. What actually happened to him is a mystery. Turkish historians tell us only that the emperor was very brave. The Constantine died fighting by the city gates. The city is taken, he's supposed to have cried, and I'm still alive and he ran off towards the battle and into the flash of legend. The man then killed ten pashas and sixty soldiers with his lance, and at the end, poor Constantine was toppled from his horse and cried to God Almighty, the creator of the universe. And the Turks cut off his head and stuck it on a pole.
As he rode through the streets of Constantinople on the first day of the Turkish conquest, Sultan Mehmet found whole districts of the sacred city derelict and abandoned, saw hovels and graveyards built amongst the ruins of its legendary palaces. He was awed, though, by the Imperial Church of St. Sophia and declared its venerable shell to be a building made for God. So the Church of St. Sophia, the Church of the Divine Wisdom, was converted to the Mosque of Aya Sophia, the Mosque of the Divine Wisdom. Images of old Byzantium had glimmered at the edge of Asia for a thousand years. Now new ghosts, new legends and new peoples came to haunt its fabled stones. Legend tells that Mehmed rode into St. Sophia on his war horse and placed his finger in this magic column and spun the church around to face Mecca for the call to prayer. History tells that the Sultan ordered the tomb of Constantine the Great, the founder of Byzantium, to be demolished, along with the burial church of the ancient emperors, and this great mosque, the funerary mosque of Mehmet the Conqueror, was put up in its place. Yet Mehmet, a humane and sympathetic man still wondered at this ancient ruined city and its unyielding inhabitants. The most eminent Byzantine left alive inside the city was Gennadius, the theologian. Mehmet visited him here in the monastery of Christ Pantocrator. Who were the people of this crumbling ancient city, the Sultan asked him, and what exactly was their faith? Like most of the inhabitants of this most stubborn city, Gennadius would only answer for himself. You may not call me a Greek, he said, because I do not believe as those ancient pagan people once believed. You might call me a Byzantine, because I was born in this city, but I prefer simply to call myself a Christian. He might also have added that he considered himself to be an exclusive member, a leading light of the society that was God's kingdom on this earth. Mehmet was pleased enough with the old boy's answer to give the penniless church a bag of gold make Gennadius its leader, to give him a white mule, and to give him authority too over all the Christians of his empire. It was an arrangement that lasted for four centuries. As for Gennadius' beloved monastery, well, its church became a madrasa, an Islamic public school, and one Zayrik became a very famous preacher in this city. Now, when Mehmet first came to the church, his quick eye had noticed a great lion of stone sarcophagi along the aisle there. In fact, they were the tombs, the sarcophagi, the last kings of Byzantium. John of Florence was buried here, his brother, their queens. These he took for his new palace in the city. He also took a slab of stone laid in that trench over there. For centuries, pilgrims have believed that that had been the very slab of stone on which the body of the Lord Jesus Christ had laid after the crucifixion. They said you could still see Mary's tears upon it, glistening like pearls. Over the centuries, 
Zayrik's school became a mosque. The district became quite poor. The mosque sold off its great white shining marble pillars and put in these balks of stone instead. And the great screen, the altar screen from the church, whose golden panels now stand on the high altar of St. Mark's in Venice, were turned into that, a minbar, a pulpit for reading the Quran. So it all seems to have gone, doesn't it? But there's still something here. If you lift the carpets of the mosque and go through to the ancient floor underneath, then you'll see a memory of Imperial Byzantium. There are still descendants of the Byzantines today, a dwindling community at the ancient heart of one of the largest cities in the modern world. Their worship in this sole surviving ancient church is guaranteed by the proclamations of ancient sultans hanging on its walls. Their church has survived for schism and poverty. For a while, the deep distrust of Rome led them towards Calvinism. But here they are still, in their holy city, with their own faith. Scattered, too, through myriads of monasteries and far-flung churches, pale shadows of the ancient earthly empire of Byzantium. Most of Constantinople's ancient churches, though, were soon converted into mosques. This little mosque was once a chapel in the ancient palace of Byzantium. Endowed with lands and properties, these converted churches were transformed into self-financing charitable trusts, the religious and financial centers of the city's neighborhoods, and the means by which Constantinople was converted to Islam and revived. Under Turkish rule, Constantinople was to become a rich and thriving city once again, the center of a mighty empire, just as it had been a thousand years before. Just before the conquest of Constantinople, a radical young bishop called Bessarion, Plethon's most brilliant pupil, had returned to Italy and had been made a cardinal of Rome. Some historians detect his portrait in this tragic bearded figure talking with Italian friends, chic young men of the Renaissance, painted by Piero della Francesca. Here at Rome, Bessarion did what Byzantines had done at Constantinople for centuries. He made a villa by the city walls. This villa, one of the first in the modern Western world, a memory of old Byzantium. Bessarion spent his life making a memorial for Byzantium by founding an academy of scholars. You know, I suppose Bessarion bought his academy here when he got very hot in the summer months. This academy 
It was a group of people who he'd gathered around him. Some were exiled Byzantines, many of them were Europeans. But everybody who could help him hold the identity of Byzantium together for as long as possible. Poets, artists, writers, translators, all sorts of people. Couldn't have been that difficult to find people because this was a really fashionable idea. Dear old Plethon had introduced Plato to the West. The Renaissance was beginning. This is early Renaissance building. For a few years, this was the coolest place on the planet. So you've got to think, perhaps, that this was the place, too, where one day in the summer, 1452, Bessarion sat down to write to Mistra. He was writing a letter of condolence to Plethon's sons. The old man had died with the spring flowers in June of that year. Bessarion wrote a letter, such a letter, he said that Plethon had been his teacher, his father and his friend. It was one of the last authentic letters of the ancient world. After that, Byzantium became something to be seen in libraries and museums. Above all, Bessarion preserved the dream. He gathered the pure air of Mistra, the ideals of Constantinople, the energy of ancient wisdom, and made a single beauteous image of that most complicated empire. Bessarion was an enabler, a producer, a preserver of ideas and images, the assembler of the largest Byzantine library the world has ever seen a collection whose fragments are still stored in the great libraries of the West. The man was Mr. Byzantium. He supported huge numbers of fellow exiles. He also used to place refugees all over Europe in jobs. This is a handmade Greek text of Homer's Iliad made by a refugee from Mistra. And in the front of this beautiful volume is a picture of Homer wearing a Byzantine hat. The West had seen nothing like this flood of wisdom that was pouring from Byzantium. Homer, ancient Roman law, and a myriad of other texts and they'd seen nothing like Bessarion's Academy. Part of the modern world, its science and its scholarship, was started by these exiles from Byzantium. Plethon and Bessarion first taught the West old Plato's heady individualism that so fills the modern world. Bessarion too told a Westerner about an ancient text that inspired Columbus to sail west from Europe on the east wind to America. There is, though, a deeper and yet more fundamental legacy, a vision of a universal order that stretches back through Byzantium, through Roman Greece to the Bible and the most ancient East. A vision that still fills the world today. A vision that exiled Byzantine artists drew out for us in dazzling detail at Voronets, the most beautiful of Romania's lonely monasteries. See that cross there in the middle? That's the cross of our Lord standing on the holy throne of Byzantium, the center of the world. To the left, to the left is good paradise. There's all the lords and ladies of Byzantium pressing through the pearly gates. On the right, hell. The Turks and everybody else, all the bad people struggling to get out. Good and bad, plus and minus, past and future, with heaven above and hell below, and pure energy at the center a structured universal order that the modern world still understands and uses every day. 
And if there's nothing there that you can see from the modern world, just look at those demons, as black as SS officers, prodding their victims towards the ovens. That's a hell we've made reality. And look at that over there in paradise, the tree of life, the center of man's wisdom, the very plant that the god Gilgamesh 6,000 years ago in ancient Ur in Mesopotamia searched for. To him, the elixir of life was understanding. For us, perhaps, it's penicillin. Then again, there's something here that's unique. Above all the bustle of the world, the laws and ladies, the gods and demons, coming through and behind the very scroll of time itself, the lord of the universe. The heart of the atom, heaven's order in a grain of sand. Byzantium's fundamental legacy, this image of a universal structure the universal order is as basic to the order of the modern world as is DNA to every individual in it. Nowadays, Constantinople, the heart of old Byzantium, is called Istanbul, an old Byzantine phrase that simply means the city. Inside the modern city, though, the past is disappearing. Ruins are often melancholy, but they should seldom make you angry. The end of Byzantium wasn't really brought about by the wicked West or the terrible Turk. Things pass, as the poet said. The cowboys had never shot the Indians. The Great Plains would not be filled with shining teepees and herds of buffaloes. Nonetheless, we should honor the past and cherish it. It's a memory, a solid memory of our beginnings. And think of Byzantium too, as a flash of silver, as a dream of jewels. As an image of a god sitting on a golden throne and of an emperor sitting in this palace in his imitation. Think of the culture that gave us the rule of Roman law. And the image of a holy mother, much beloved, caressing a baby child. And think of Byzantium too, this extraordinary empire set between the east and west, whose very ending set those two things far apart but in whose own time gave so many good ideas to both of them. When sailing from Byzantium, listen to the city's fading sounds. Visit in your mind its golden images and all the shadows of its history. And as you wave goodbye, you'll discover that you can never really leave the past behind. <laughs> 